Hello, I'm Alex Jones, host of InfoWars Nightly News, and I'm also a documentary filmmaker. And I've been doing a lot of research concerning preparedness because my listeners have been asking me my opinion on it because it's one of the you know, hottest phenomenons uh, in society right now. And that's for good reason. There is a, a social conscience or social instinct that all is not well in the state of the United States or the world. We see incredible degeneration in our economy thanks to the globalist. Uh, we see uh, crime increasing, our prisons filled. We have 90% of the population living in uh, urban areas and are almost completely unself-sufficient. If we have a Great Depression like they had back in the 1920s and 30s, it is going to be absolutely devastating. And so, millions of people a month are buying guns at record levels. They're, they're prepping, they're buying food, they're planting gardens. All of that is great. But an area I don't really hear discussed, or if I do, it's done in a very, uh, you know, thin surface way, is location. Now, I've known enough to move outside Austin, Texas, um, where I broadcast my radio show. But I understand that I still live just a few miles from a major thoroughfare. And if society uh, has any type of collapse or major disruption, every major city in this country will basically look like New Orleans in a very, very short period of time. And so that's why I personally am getting prepared with solar and with uh, well water and rainwater collection and firearms. But I'm also getting prepared politically out there trying to wake up others show that as these hard times unfortunately get worse because the globalists have engineered it that way, that more people are awake and understand what's happening. Because the social engineers want us dependent on them. They admit that that's their plan. Uh, the question is, who's going to make it to that finish line before this accelerated collapse actually takes place and these larger wars that they want to start? Now, in the next hour, I want to break down with one of the foremost experts out there, Joel Skousen. He's written the book, Strategic Relocation. We'll put that up on screen, North American Guide to Safe Places, third edition. But I wanted to have a visual guide uh, to the book with the author walking us through this. Now, Joel, of course, uh, his uh, famous uncle wrote The Naked Communist, exposing that powerful elites were funding communism. Joel himself is an author, and he is the editor of the acclaimed World Affairs Brief. Uh, that uh, breaks down things on a daily and weekly basis. He was also a Marine Corps uh, fighter pilot who made uh, carrier landings at night. We were talking about that before we started taping here today. Maybe at the end, he'll talk a bit about that, you know, staring death in the eye, uh, as we all do in one way or another. And as we talk about trying to get prepared and ready for what's already hitting us. You see, people now realize the new world order globalism is real. And about 2% of the population is now trying to prep. Most experts I talk to say that if three to four to 5% start to prep, that's gonna drive up prices on everything and is gonna put prepping uh, and preparation out of reach of a lot of people. So it's important now to start moving in that direction and hopefully we can reverse the tide of tyranny and this won't be needed. But if we don't reverse it, uh, it's obviously gonna be needed. So it's insurance that is also a way of life and self-sufficiency that all of our ancestors and every culture did just out of hand. I mean, whose grandparents out there didn't have storable food and things like that and uh, kept some money in the mattress? And we called them old fogies. Well, that common sense is coming back into style. So with us is Joel Skousen uh, to walk us through his book in a visual format. And this truly is the secrets of survival from one of the foremost experts. He also as is one of the foremost experts in uh, safe homes and consults all over the country and the world. Joel, great to have you here with us. Good to be with you, Alex. Uh, you've got the floor. Break down what you're going to go over here uh, today. You know, I got this background on strategic relocation. My original uh, expertise was in high security architecture. I was one of the pioneers in the field, wrote the book, The Secure Home. It's been in print now for 30 years. And it's the Bible of that, uh, that genre of building. But as I did so and, and designed and worked with people to help them build homes all over the country and even in some in, in uh, Central America, I unknowingly became a judge of what was a safe location and wasn't a, what wasn't a safe location. And so about two years before Y2K hit, I wrote the book Strategic Relocation, the first edition. Uh, 
It's been a long gestation since there. The book has been selling steadily since 1998. But since this new third edition came out, it has all new color maps of every state in the Union, provinces of Canada, uh, all of the regional threats, uh, charts galore. It's the analysis in this book, as well as the graphics that leads people through a complete understanding of every state, helps them walk through the decision process. Because frankly, this is not easy. It's not easy because very few people can go and leave their jobs and go out into rural areas where there's safety. In other words, security financially is the antithesis of security in terms of location. Because the safest locations are where there's very few people, very rural, and that's the opposite of what you need to have jobs. But what happened in, in, in Y2K, I was one of the advisors to Gary North when he was really pushing Y2K, and the world owes a great debt of gratitude to Gary for warning about Y2K. In fact, the establishment laughs at him now, but they took his warning, they fixed most of the problems, and didn't give him credit for the fact that he goaded them into it. But there were a lot of people in Y2K that said, the end of the world is coming, I'm bailing out of society, going out to rural. They bought a lot of survival equipment, generators, food storage, et cetera. And when it didn't happen, it actually did happen. There was about five major events that the media covered up. But really, the, the, the infrastructure stayed together. And about a year later, I started to get calls from people saying, uh, Joel, I hear you do consulting and strategic relocation. I'm out here in Podunksville and I run out of money, self-sufficiency turned out to be a lot more expensive than I thought. Uh, what do I do? And I said, I hate to say this, but you gotta go back into society, you gotta reestablish your financial lifeline, and then you gotta do this all over again properly, carefully, using contingency planning rather than just bailing out. Now, there are some people who can live anywhere, who can live off of a computer, and who can uh, uh, go anywhere they want, live in a rural community, but even them, and I was one of those that did that myself. I took an airplane and I flew all around the country and I picked out the most idyllic spot in Oregon, Hood River Valley, moved my whole family there. And then it came time, we'd homeschooled them all, it came time to college and I realized there's no way to give these guys a college education in, in Ruralsville. And I actually had to move the family back to another safe location that was near a metropolitan area so that I could provide education. So you see, even for a survival expert like myself, it isn't a clear-cut, easy choice. You have compromises that every location has. But the first process I like to take people through, which I'd like to do in this interview, is how to engage in strategic thinking. Most people, and I can't blame them, we're victims of the world that we live in, but we live in a world of illusions. Now, those illusions of prosperity have somewhat broken since 2008. But in fact, people still think that things are pretty good. Restaurants are full, the movie houses are full, people are still spending money. We have kind of a segmented, selective recession, selective depression. There are people who are out of work, who are really hurting, who can't raise their money or their income with, uh, to match inflation. And there's those people that are on the receiving end of inflation, uh, two or three steps down from the government putting money out. But we live under the illusion of prosperity, that these things are coming back. Every night on the nightly news, as you know, the business people are always hyping recovery. It's just around the corner. They've been doing that for two years now. Still not here. But in fact, there are signs of an inflationary recovery starting. And uh, it's a combination of a couple of things. One, we have sat for three or four years not inflating, not going into deeper debt, at least in terms of the consumers. And that's been healing the economy slowly. It's been getting people used to what I call the real economy, that is, that is not based upon consumer debt completely, it's based upon people's disposable income. And at the same point, we have had consolidation of bad properties, bad values, these things are being liquidated through foreclosures, and all of that's healthy. All of that should occur. And in fact, the economy would heal if they wouldn't try to pump more money into it, recover. But I suspect, my analysis is that we're gonna see one more bubble that they're going to create and it's limited, it can't get as high as the previous bubble because we're facing what's called stagflation. The only tool in the, in the, the toolkit for the globalist, for the, the Fed, is inflation. But they're limited because if they go much over 10% inflation, 
they start to strangle the people who can't adjust their income. And as that economy and the uh, deflationary effects take over, it balances out the inflation and keeps inflation from getting to hyperinflation. To get to hyperinflation, and that's one of the biggest misnomers in our society, is that there's going to be hyperinflation. You really have to have two things. You have to have a fairly modest supply of money that you can double and triple fairly rapidly. We're well beyond that. We've got a base in dollars worldwide of anywhere between 200 and 300 trillion dollars. It's not very easy even for the Fed at 10 trillion a year to double or triple the money supply. Second thing is you've got to have an automatic injection mechanism where government increases everybody's income so that they accommodate inflation. That's what happened in Germany. They started taking over the payment of wages. Um, in, when uh, France was... Instead, we've got a depression in the economy and then they've done some inflating, but mainly just to pay off some of the big banking debts. Most of the inflation has gone into what I call the speculative economy. It is funneled through the investment banks that goes into their people and that money isn't going into the real economy, maybe 20%, but most of it's churning in the stock market, churning in the Forex, foreign exchange market. And that's why it isn't getting here and that's why the stock market keeps ballooning up. It's a separate economy that they've built what I call the, the speculative economy. Um, so what I'm saying is that we hear a lot in the prepper community. There's this show called um, Doomsday Preppers. And of course, it's hyping ridiculousness and, make, and poking fun. But there are some legitimate people in here who have done a, a tremendous job of preparing. But I have to chuckle a little bit when I've seen some of the shows because of the reasons they give. Almost 90% of those on Doomsday Preppers think there's an absolute total economic collapse coming within nine months. And even though fundamentals, Austrian economics would say that has to happen or it's true, they underestimate the powers that be who have these power to create and control money, banks, and, and the press. And new mini bubbles. That's right. They underestimate the power of the powers that be to keep this economy floating by adjusting the rate of inflation, balancing inflation versus depression. Sure, it's a slow rotting slide. That's what the globalists admit they want. They don't want big events that could wake up too many people. Exactly. But that brings up my next question for you, then I want to get into the presentation that's so important here. Why do you think then so many more people are getting ready? Well, part of it is that they don't understand the nature of the conspiracy. They don't understand that there is a great powerful force, not only to take down liberty, which is what their agenda is, but to make sure that they don't get the blame for it. So they're going to use, they blame it on everyone, they blame it on the free market, they blame it on business cycle. It's not the business, it's the monetary cycle created by the Fed. And ultimately, these people are going to escape blame because they're planning a war for us, a third world war, a nuclear war, which in fact will wipe out a great deal of the financial centers and let them to walk away and say, it wasn't our fault. What's the strategy on the Arab Spring and putting Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda light into Libya and all these other countries? The big agenda on that is a little bit complex, if you'll bear with me. They have dealt with these people for years, these tyrants like Gaddafi in Libya and, uh, and Assad in Syria. They did uh, rendition flights to Syria where they tortured them. I mean, these people have known these are uh, evil people, but they've never taken them down before. Why now? Why the Arab Spring? It isn't because of democracy. It isn't because they want those people free. In fact, they're not free. Egypt has yet to achieve any kind of freedom. Libya is still in factionalized infighting, not gonna be free. Uh, you got a lot of... Um, you know, Arab nationals and radicals, a lot of uh, Muslim fundamentalists running this show, they don't have an agenda about letting people do what they want. So the real agenda here in terms of fomenting the Arab Spring is to create conflict that is going to allow them to rearrange the chess pieces in the Middle East. Right now in the Middle East, you have Israel as the rising, uh, rising emerging power surrounded by nations that have thousands of missiles that threaten Israel, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and Iran. So they're targeting Iran because Iran is the strongest boy on the block. They control more or less the other elements of the uh, Arab fundamentalists, especially Syria, and Syria controls Lebanon. If they attack Iran, if they get Iran out of the picture, of course they know that Iran will retaliate before that attack is complete. That retaliation is going to give Israel an excuse to launch out militarily 
and bring the U.S. in because the U.S. troops being in that area will get struck as well. Once we're bloodied, we have an excuse to come in. I think they're gonna take down most of Israel's enemies in this next Middle East war. And they're gonna neuter Iran, not by invading because we can't afford another invasion. It would be very unpopular like Iraq and Afghanistan is. But I think what they're gonna do is not just go after the nuclear weapons, uh, or the nuclear enrichment center. There are no nuclear weapons in Iran. But they're going to use the same excuse to take out all the military infrastructure and take out a lot of the civilian in infrastructure, bring Iran to um, a third world country, right now a second world country, and neuter it, get it out of the way so that it's not a problem. I think, in fact, they're going to take Syria down before then only because if Iran retaliated, Syria will also retaliate. It has the most weapons nearest to Israel. Israel would take a tremendous hit. Their aero anti-missile system is not capable of stopping the thousands of missiles that Syria can put out there combined with those in Lebanon. And if Egypt joins the ranks as well, it could be really devastating for Israel. So I think they're gonna take Syria out before. That's why they're engendering all of this uh, foreign invasion of uh, supporting the rebels and why they don't give Assad credit for anything, including a ceasefire that continued to exacerbate that ceasefire, as you've reported on your news very, very well. And so uh, getting the Middle East out of the way is just a prelude towards the larger war they want to start. But it's part and parcel of the larger war because part of that is you've got to build dude, Russia and China, who are going to prosecute this war against the West, need to have an excuse so they don't look at, like aggressors. That excuse is being handed to them by our globalist leaders, by this intervention. The underlying cause of all of the intervention is the desire to give the West the reputation of the bully of the world. And that's what they, they did in the Slavic countries. That's why in Serbia, in the attack, they went after civilian infrastructure to create hatred against Americans. Americans were popular in Russia and in Serbia and other, until they went after civilian infrastructure, bombed bridges and power plants and television stations, not just military targets. Israel did that same thing in the last invasion of Lebanon. They went after civilian infrastructure. No need to do that except to antagonize the population. And you say, why would anyone want to antagonize? People have to think that, understand that there's systematic evil in the world. This isn't just one bad guy looking after his personal interests. This is systematic evil that thinks in strategic ways. We have to learn to think strategic. It's a well. three-level chess, and it's a stratagem, a deceptive stratagem. That's right. And the stratagem is we're going to antagonize the world. It hands Russia and China the excuse to say, we went to war with the West so that we could stop the bully of the world, and the world will applaud, just as most of the world applauded when a Bush, you know, Got out of That's why we learned it was really the CIA that leaked out the Abu Ghraib photos who'd actually That's ordered exactly it. That's exactly right. I mean, all of it is systematic and then put America's name on the globalist agenda. Incredible. You're watching the film presentation of strategic relocation with Joel Skousen and myself, Alex Jones. We're going to go right back to it here in a moment at PrisonPlanet.tv. But I want to encourage all of the viewers out there to think about what's just happened in the last week and a half. And of course, we're talking about Hurricane Sandy uh, and uh, now the election. This society is incredibly complex. And when anything gets disrupted by an election uh, or by a storm, society degenerates very, very quickly. And that's why it's important that even if you're going to live in a big city, to know the escape routes. Uh, that aren't going to be used like the major thoroughfares that are going to, that are going to turn into uh, death traps, major highways and things like that. And to know about different regions of the country that are statistically safer if things ever get so bad that you decide to emergency relocate. It's about thinking about our surroundings and being aware. And this is a process that I've gotten deeper into uh, as this new world order engineered collapse accelerates. That's why it's important for everyone watching this video presentation to get the DVD at InfoWarsStore.com. When you do that, you're not only supporting our operation and what we're doing fighting the globalist, more importantly, you're getting a hard copy of the film with the expanded extras in a higher res quality so that you can also show it to your friends and family. There's also, of course, the internet kill switch they're designing. Uh, 
uh, more and more systems to delete videos off the web, so it's important to have a hard copy as well. But not just a hard copy of the film. The book Strategic Relocation, third edition, that is brand spanking new, has hundreds of color maps and details those escape routes, goes over a list of countries uh, and politically how safe they are or how dangerous they are and the different attributes and problems associated with it. It gets into so many different angles that we also cover uh, in the film that's coming up here. But again, it is so important for those of us that are aware of what's happening in this world to get even more prepared and then to teach others how to be prepared because the globalists do not want you being prepared. They want you dependent so they can control you. This is what Stalin did uh, with the kulaks in areas of Eastern Europe when they took over, cutting off the infrastructure and making them starve to death in Ukraine and other areas. This is what Mao did with the Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward from 1949 and on. Uh, this is what Hitler did to occupied areas. This is about consolidation because the name of the game is control. So we have the film, Strategic Relocation. We have the book, Strategic Relocation, that everybody should keep in their car for just the roadmaps alone. And there is Joel Skousen's book, The Secure Home. We have all of these publications discounted with free citizen rule books with every order at InfoWarsStore.com. This is a win, 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 win. You support our operations to get the news and the truth out when you buy books and videos and T-shirts and things from us at InfoWarsStore.com. You get hard copies of this key information to educate and inform yourself to a higher level to then force multiply that to your friends, your family, your neighbors, your community. And I'll assure you, even if you're a special forces veteran, you will learn something from these books. Uh, even if you are a woodsman or a huntsman, you will learn something from this information. Uh, because Joel Skousen, uh, I've researched uh, the work he's done, and quite frankly, it's amazing that he's built houses in all 50 states, that he's consulted all over the world, that he's lived in many of the countries that he breaks down in this film and in these books. We're going to go back to the documentary right now, but again, please uh, think about going over to InfoWarsStore.com or InfoWarsShop.com and securing copies of the books and the film uh, so that you have hard copies in your library and support our operations. We take you back now to strategic relocation. Well, Joel, I interrupted you and segued off in the Middle East, but uh, get back into the point you, you, that you were trying to make previously. Well, all of these strategic antagonisms around the world is meant to set the United States, set the West up. And that's why NATO's involved in this. So that East, Western Europe is as guilty in the eyes of the world as the West, as the antagonists, the bullies of the world. Uh, Ron Paul is absolutely right. They hate us not because of our freedoms. They hate us because we're in those countries, occupying those countries. And worse, our CIA is undermining leaders, changing leadership, uh, getting dirt on leaders so that they can manipulate world leaders to follow the globalist agenda. And all of this is going to eventually end up very bad for the United States. We're going to have a nuclear preemptive strike against this country. The leaders want it, they're preparing for it, they're covering for it. They aren't telling the American people that Russia is building a tremendous nuclear arsenal, even as we continue to uh, disarm, even as they do not disarm even while we disarm, and we don't tell the American people that we know that they're not disarming. I mean, this is a tremendous charade, uh, an evil charade. Our Western counterparts even took part in, the, in promulgating the phony fall of the Soviet Union. They knew that this was a fraud. They knew that the communists were simply going underground, that these were puppets like Yeltsin and Putin who still worked for the communist hierarchy. They knew, as anyone who in Moscow knows, you still hear the words, the party tells you to do this, the party says this. And they never even took the Red Stars off the tanks. They marched on May Day uh, uh, you know, recently. Uh, and break down for people, then before we get into preparedness, because this is important just briefly, the different factions you see, because I look at your theory and your idea uh, that they're planning to let the United States be attacked and then basically rise up this new, you know, global order to, you know, counter it. And it's not about freedom. It's all about this hegemonic control. But I see the underground bases. Uh, I see the giving away of the Panama Canal. I see the destroying of infrastructure while building an underground 
uh, infrastructure, and, and not just physically underground, but a shadow government system. There's instant, uh, you know, evidence everywhere that that the elite is you know building up towards the type of thing you're talking about. There is evidence. Uh, for example, you know, when I was designing and uh, uh, helping to build and oversee high security homes around the nation, I would find contractors who would say that. He's former CIA, he's former Treasury, he's former, and they're all building bunkers under the house. So they know that something big is coming. They're not building those bunkers, and the U.S. isn't building huge underground bases and bunkers because of some terrorist threat. They know that a massive nuclear attack is coming. They want that attack to come. But there are secret weapon systems. In fact, it's kept Russia and China for years from attacking the United States. They're afraid of what they don't know about. That's why their espionage is at, at full beaver pitch in the United States because they're trying to find out what they're really going to face if they, um, if they attack the United States. And the United States is bending over backwards to appear weak, to give concessions. And you know, you hear some of these uh, eavesdropping conversations about the Russians. They can't understand those Americans. They seem so stupid. They seem like, you know, the, it's so, we're so easy to infiltrate. They don't realize, though, that our own government is laughing themselves saying, oh, they think that they- Because they're only infiltrating one level. They're infiltrating really the stage managed circus. And we don't capture and we don't arrest their spies because we want to make them feel comfortable that we're vulnerable, that we're easy to infiltrate. But in fact, there are sections that can't be easily infiltrated and those are not being prepared to save America. They're being prepared only to bring out those secret weapons to prosecute World War III after we've been attacked, after we've been devastated, because it's very simple. If the American military is intact, the Americans are gonna rise up and say, go get those guys, you know, let's prosecute this war and use our own troops to do it. But if our troops are decimated, then we come out and we say, what can we do? And our globalist leaders say, oh yes, our, we're no longer a military power. Our only salvation is join together with all the remaining nations, form a new United Nations, probably called the League of Democracies or something. And we'll make this militarized, and as a world organization, we'll go after Russia and China. Well, Henry Kissinger has said things like that. He said, faced with a big enough crisis, America will accept UN troops in Los Angeles. Yeah. And several of the globalists over the years have made these things that we have to get globalism by stealth. We have to fool people into accepting it. Uh, this is going to be the mother of all terrorist attacks. It's going to make 9-11, a government operation from beginning to end, look like a pitnik. And they engineered on record in hindsight, World War I to get League of Nations. That's right. World War II engineered, financed, enemies built up to try to get it. And then they're gonna use World War III. I mean, that's their plan, that's their program. That's what they do. That's right. So strategic relocation is a systematic way to think strategically in the future about how do I safeguard? And it isn't a doomsday scenario necessarily. I'm saying this is insurance, just like you said. You've got to be prepared while we fight to retain our liberty while we fight to expose globalism, we have to realize we're talking about a very powerful combination of power, very powerful. They own establishment media. They own about 75% of congressmen. They have dirt on them. They can control them. They own almost all the judges at the appellate and higher level, even the so-called conservative ones, they have dirt on. Now, they don't control them on every decision lest it become obvious, but they can turn the screws when they need to, like when it comes up to exposing or ruling appropriately on Obama's lack of citizenship. That is never gonna see the light of Why day. Why are they nation. openly marching in with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of Defense and telling Congress the UN gives us orders now? Obama writes letters saying, I take orders from the UN. He became the first president to sit on the National Security Council, violating Article 1, Section 9. Why are they being so naked in all of this right now, in your view? Well, it's naked to those of us who look at this, but if you look at what it looks like from the press, it's just a mention here and there, and they don't give it em emphasis. If someone in Congress to really get up and say, this is a violation of the Constitution, there is no power, as Ron Paul has repeated, there is no power to take orders from NATO or the, or the United uh, Nations. They have no authority over everything. And if the press gave that, you know, you can mention something once and it means nothing to the American people, it has to become a drumbeat, and they don't make it a drumbeat. They may mention it once, but, People don't get upset unless the media focuses on it. So what to you and I may be obvious is not obvious to the American people. Nevertheless, it is slowly accustoming all of your pundits, all of your people who are not 
died in the world co-conspirators, but yes men going along trying to to improve their careers by saying yes to the establishment. Those people get these subliminal messages. No, exactly. What happens is while they simultaneously make fun of us that are awake and actually read what the globalists say, they've gone in just the last 10 years from going, you're a kook, no world government or globalism exists to, you're a kook because you don't like the new world order and globalism. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, you said it didn't exist. Well, now I'm bad because I don't want to embrace it. And so they're like, okay, the UN does tell us what to do. You know, what's the big deal? But it's benevolent. That's their message now. This isn't harmful. This is good for humanity, good for the environment. What they don't realize, and uh, you know, the hotel I'm staying at has this big card on it. We believe in sustainable development. Have you got a clue that it's not about, I mean, who could be against sustainable development per se, but it's about the control agenda that's underneath sustainable development. It means they set the agenda. That's right. It means they control what and decide what's sustainable. And when you decide, when you find out and wake up someday what that decision means, no gasoline, no electricity at reasonable prices, then you're not going to like sustainable, or at least their version of sustainable development. And they admit sustainable, more strong than others say, is about controlling people. It's not about actually helping the environment or empowering people. It's, it's about total control. Uh, g give us an overview now. Let's launch into it um, of what you're going to be covering here. Well, as I began to say, the most important thing is for people to start to think strategically, meaning Stop looking at the news alone. You've got to get alternative sources of information. You've got to understand that there's a different underlying agenda. We are not in Iraq because of democracy. We're not in Afghanistan. It's never going to have democracy. It's there for antagonism, for capture of resources, for changing the balance of power in the Middle East, a lot of things that are not good for America. What this all this, this means is eventually, when these illusions are stripped away, uh, when this war finally rebels against the United States, in one day, America will go from day to night. And if you haven't prepared in advance, there's not enough time to prepare in 24 hours, even if you saw it that early. Now, it's important not only to not be on the last train out of town, most people won't even be ready and won't be able to get out of town when any of these nuclear weapons fall, because there'll be absolute panic there's going to be instant social unrest because nobody is prepared. FEMA can't even hope to handle a national crisis of this emergency any more than they could handle Katrina. Don't even think about getting on the freeways. They'll be instantly clogged. You have to have either got out of town sooner or be prepared to hunker. But that would happen two or three months into a serious collapsed depression. I mean, I mean, if you go back as I'm introed, and I know you're going to talk about threats later, but. If 90% of people were on the farm in the Great Depression and most of them self-sufficient and now right at 90% are in the cities and half of the 10% that are on a farm are self-sufficient, 5% self-sufficient versus 90% or close to it. And I was reading that 7 million people died of starvation or complications from malnutrition in the decade of the Great Depression. I mean, my God, if there was a true collapsed depression, wouldn't need a nuclear attack on the US. It's true, but the reason they need a nuclear attack is that a depression wouldn't foment a globalist agenda. Whereas if you destroy a nation militarily and you feel threatened, then it's much easier for someone to say the solution is a globalist combination of power to counter this evil power of Russia and China. Basically, you attack and kill the old republic, pose as the savior, America runs into the arms of the new world order. That's right, and that doesn't happen with an economic collapse. And besides, if you have an economic collapse before war, they get the blame. They don't want the blame. And you're thinking strategically how the globalists operate. What you've said does fit in to the stratagem that I see them carrying out. But, but uh, talking about it, if 50 million people saw this video, that might stop them. It, it might. I mean, your work, for example, at Infowars.com has done a tremendous amount to influence, for example, the TSA, and they're bending over backwards to still continue to grow their agenda, but without offending as much, and they keep promising. They are afraid of the backlash that comes from knowledge, and that's part of the reason for my writing the book and part of the reason for going out on the limb, talking about issues that are ins sensitive, like conspiracy against liberty, about nuclear war, things that nobody in the mainstream, there's only two or three of us analysts in the United States that are openly warning that there's gonna be a nuclear war with Russia and China. And we have access, the government has twice as much information as we do, and they're absolutely silent. 
fact, I've had intelligence people from the Defense Intelligence Agency tell me we have orders never to criticize Russia or to reveal anything we know about Russia. Now, why would you do that? You weren't trying to cover for a nation. If they're supposedly down and out and our friends and our allies, why would you need to cover? Meanwhile, Putin's constantly bragging about the new hypersonic Topol M that can dodge everything and, 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 and rolling out new jets. And uh, the, the, the Chinese president said, prepare for war with the US just three months ago. Yes, uh, the Chinese are a real problem and they're gonna be a problem for Russia someday. It is my theory that in fact, during this war, even though China will start as an ally with Russia, so that it has an excuse to capture the entire Pacific Basin from Japan all the way down to Australia. And that's why Australia and New Zealand are not good retreat places because they will be occupied by China in the next war. Nevertheless, they'll not necessarily treat everyone harshly because they know that they're going to switch sides during the war, attack Russia's rear, play like their allies of the West in order to get more aid and trade. And then after the war's over, they'll become the new Cold War enemy. That's my theory. And um, so I think uh, we're talking about three predator centers of power, Anglo-American establishment, Russia, and China. And they are not controlled by one another. They're independent predator centers. They're all each trying to develop their version of a new world order controlled by them. But they will make temporary alliances and induce one or the other to attack. That's what we're seeing. That's well, exactly. They take whatever the most abusive form of social engineering is from the others and cobble them together. And the Chinese communists are always saying, it'll be our new world order. And the Russians go, no, ours. And then the Anglo-American European system, it'll be ours. And it's just a rush towards evil. Now, going back to strategic relocation, the major threat that we're going to face, and this is in, I, I take a great deal of time in the book talking about threats. Because part of thinking strategically is understanding what the realistic threats are. And I'm not just talking about tornadoes and earthquakes or tidal waves. I'm talking about the longer term threats that come mostly from what you correctly surmised is the movement of people into population centers. The urbanization of America, which of course the environmentalists want everybody urban. But it's totally short-sighted. Because if everybody's urban, no one can be self-sufficient if you're urban. You can't grow enough food. You can't get a water, you, you, your own water. You but it's short-sighted if they really meant well. They admit in the Agenda 21 that the plan is to have us in controlled areas. And that's why they're attacking the Amish and everybody. They don't want real sustainability. Yeah, I think that, that's right. They actually want people dependent on government. It makes them very much under their fist. And that's where we're all headed by being lured into high-rise, uh, urban, eco-friendly, pollution-free cities. Well, it's not gonna work out that way. The greatest pollution of all will be a stinking city that's cut off from food and water and starts to rot, and rot very rapidly. Now, you don't wanna be part of a major metropolitan area uh, when that happens, and so this is the crux of what I teach people in strategic relocation. How, because people mostly have to stay within population centers to earn a living, but how to prepare contingency planning so that you can get out into retreat areas and have the information, the forewarning signs to know how to do that. And that's the, really the only way to survive. Most people cannot get rural right now. They can't make a living, it's just impossible. So this is a solution uh, for everyone. But let's talk about this major threat. The number one that I concentrate on is not terrorism, it's not natural disaster. It's not even government or war. The major threat is population density because every crisis that threatens, even a local crisis, can turn exponential because of close proximity to other people who cannot help themselves. Even good people panic in a crisis. You don't have to be evil. It doesn't have to be just a Watts. When you have no food after three days, all of the store shelves are empty. If there's no water, it's exacerbated. If there's no, if there's no electricity, there's gonna be no gasoline. People are limited. You won't even be able to walk out of town because of the danger of, of threat from people interacting with other people. So population density is the major threat. And if you have that slide, I'd like to talk about this density. It's very interesting that you see this satellite map, this is derived from uh, nighttime lights and then converted to black and white. But if you can see the detail here, this entire half of the United States 
has three to four times the population density of this area here. It's dramatic when you see all of the shading. You know, you drive through the Midwest and the farms and you see uh, little farms here and there, but every one of these pixels and things are thousands of people. Now, this is the most populous and most dense area in the entire United States. And these two, or these three areas on the West Coast, around Seattle, Los Angeles, and San Diego are also heavily, or San Francisco and Los Angeles are heavily populated. In a crisis, any crisis and where infrastructure is cut off, these people are going to start to migrate outward. There is nothing there. There's no job to keep them. Suddenly, everybody wants to be relocated strategically. And um, there's a lot of people thinking about it. That's why the prepper movement is so big. A lot of people can't do anything about it. I would say, I think there's a ratio of about 10 to 1. People thinking about preparedness versus those that are actually preparing. So preparedness has increased maybe tenfold in the past two years. That means there's 200-fold of people who are thinking about it but aren't going to be prepared. But nevertheless, when these things start to fall out, they're going to be fleeing as fast as they can with everyone else. And so it's important to track how those people are going to leave those major cities when you make decisions about leaving, especially if you decide that you're going to move out into the periphery of these areas, you've got to be very careful to make sure that those outflows of refugees Well, that's great stuff I mean, during the Great Depression, uh, you know, my grandparents, people talked about just people walking down the roads and begging, can I chop some wood for some food? They're like, we already have people chop wood, but here's a little food. But by the end of the Depression, they'd almost hunted out all the squirrels, all the deer. And my family were landowners and upper middle class and they almost lost everything in the Great Depression. And that was just a depression that the elite engineered to consolidate power. I mean, my gosh, under Agenda 21 and all this, uh, once the public figures out they need to get out of Dodge, it's too late. We also have the example of World War II. World War II in Germany, we have the example of the Russians coming in and every German city was being emptied out to get away from the Russians. They did not want to be occupied. Literally, entire cities were emptying out, taking to the roads. And so we know how far they go afar afield of the roads trying to get food and water and hitting the farmhouses. And basically, it was within about five to seven miles apart from every road where those farms would all be looted. And so... You have to take those kinds of things into consideration when you're considering, yes, going rural, what may look rural. That's what I call strategic thinking. Can't just think about how nice and idyllic it is in, in rural Austin, out in the suburbs. You've got to look how far am I away from a major county road that goes out there and that's going to be streaming with refugees. Refugees, There's going to be famine. They're going to be out of water, out of gas. They're going to start spanning out within walking distance. And that, for most people that are tired and hungry and modern-day people, is about five miles. You've got to be beyond that so that people so don't get So bottom line, to... I could have a place out in the edge of Austin that's, you know, a decent house. But I've thought about somewhere really far out in the middle of nowhere in, you know, the ugliest place possible, but where it has water and solar and buried food and guns, a shack. That's right. I believe in the concept of multiple eggs in various baskets rather than everything into one concentrated hole that could be compromised. So I think it is important, depending on your resources, to think that way. Now, even when you don't have the resources to develop your own retreat, people can, for example, uh, double up with relatives, friends, and other people that they know that may live in rural areas, contribute a little bit of money so they can buy food and water supplies, put in equipment like solar and generators. These are things that you can do. That's to what I've done. Out. We've got a ranch, family property, that goes back to Mexican land grants in 1830. But I've help build a metal building, help put in uh, systems, help pay for wells. And I've got, and I probably wouldn't even go there during the collapse, but I really know this is a serious threat. And it's not like some insurance I buy and then if I die in a car, my wife gets it. This is insurance that I may end up having to use. In fact, there's a good chance. So I would be insane not to be gearing up. One of the, the things that people don't realize about preparedness is that supplies are relatively available. A lot of technology, a lot of new stuff coming on the market. But I've been in this business for 40 years, and I'll tell you, it's a real roller coaster for uh, suppliers of preparedness equipment. It's either feast or famine. Right now it's feast, and supplies are tight because there's so much demand for them. But uh, it's amazing how quickly people forget when 
prosperity appears to come back. If there's another inflationary upsurge and where people think good times are here and the housing is recovering, watch out. You'll start seeing they forget. People have incredibly short-term vision, Alex. They can't see or maintain a threat very long. If it doesn't happen in a year, they'll forget about it. That's the danger of all of the bogus prophecies about the collapse coming in 2012 with the Mayan calendar things. I can guarantee Bill is not going to collapse in 2012. Well, that's right, but we'll end up getting blamed for 2012. I already have media calling me, national publications saying, so you think things are going to collapse? And I go, I've been on record saying that Mayan prophecy, uh, as I've actually gone down there and researched it, even if people believe that religion, they say it just means the start of a new age or whatever. It's totally manufactured since the 60s and 70s by globalist gurus for people that are non-religious basically, but superstitious to believe it's the end of the world. So why should they get involved? It's just a way to stand down. Uh, kind of like the rapture stuff's been used and sold by the globalists, whether you believe in it or not, to make Christians stand down and not be involved or planet X or a comet. It's always something's gonna destroy us so we never get ready for the real threat, the nuclear weapons, uh, the fractional reserve banking, the trillion, uh, 1,000 trillion plus derivatives. All of that is what could really destroy us. Biological weapons, uh, super weapons, all of those things when added together, that's the real threat. And I see the elite digging in, not for the end of the world, but for major civilization collapse and stockpiling to reemerge in the Rand Corporation plan to basically then dominate. Have an attack on themselves by opening it up to a foreign enemy, uh, that way it, it can be blamed on them, then mobilize the people under a new global fascist system. That's right. Um, one of the things that people uh, have to understand that you've got to be prepared in advance before these things happen. You have to see a long-term vision of these types of threats. You have to have good information. You've got to subscribe to your news broadcast. I put out a newsletter, the World Affairs Brief, which every week I analyze this. It's going to serve as a very good early warning because I'm watching this every day about how the Russians and Chinese are prepared. And, uh, you know, as Gary North used to say at Y2K, don't be on the last train out. It's too late. That train can get stopped. We know from Katrina, for example, a couple of lessons. Don't get on the freeways ones because they'll be trapped. You get on a freeway, it's like in an elevated mode. It's got barriers on either side. If your car goes out, if you're in, stuck in traffic, there's no way to go except abandon your vehicle and get off on foot. Um, but one other thing you learn in Katrina is you don't go into the arms of the federal government. Don't go into a FEMA camp because a FEMA refugee center becomes a concentration camp. You can't get out. They didn't let people out of the Superdome, even when it became horrible conditions. And people said, I'm better off on the outside. Could not get they out. They wouldn't let them walk out on the highways. That's right. Uh, and they use that as a laboratory test. We saw the police start stealing, uh, just total bedlam. I mean, looking at Katrina, it, it just proves the government can't and won't protect you. That's right, that's right. Now, there's also an agenda about cultural conflict brewing here. And that's one of the reasons why, no matter how much they talk about amnesty and how that's gonna guarantee the problem, it doesn't. They know, in fact, it's a magnet. They won't close the borders. They never will seal the border. They want the cultural conflict that Europe is experiencing that comes. It's not only crime, it is the fact that you water down American cultural values, conservative political values, make sure that you can never win another election. So there's that agenda. And I have in strategic relocation several maps uh, that talk about um, minority concentrations. And I don't do this because I view minorities necessarily as inferior, but because with certain cultural inflows, you have generalities you can make about the levels of crime that come from those cultural inflows and what it impacts American society. We know that there are radical people funded by globalist elements like La Raza and other organizations that want to foment uh, social unrest and uh, racial tension within this. So that's just a basic divide and conquer strategy. Just like you said, you don't want to run to some other country just because you can't really communicate. And again, it's part of that divide and conquer. That's right. But it is important to realize that certain areas of the country do are predominated with minorities that will become culturally conflicting with your values at some point. So that's one of the dangers. Uh, because the media is going to be programming. It's just oh, like yeah. Trayvon Martin, where it turns out the Justice Department had people inside there 
that's now come out trying to get a fight going and they were editing the tapes together uh, to make uh, Zimmerman sound like he was saying bad things about black people. I mean, just incredible that the system was trying to cause some type of racial conflict. That's right, and there, there is that that's going to happen. For example, the KKK is almost completely now staffed with agent provocateurs. They have northern accents. They're not southerners at all anymore. If you see any of these television personalities representing the KKK, it's very clear this is not a southerner. And uh, you have these uh, racial activists within the Latino community, too, that uh, get these people out on the streets. This is not going to bode well for America, even though... The person who's fluent in Spanish, I have many, many Latin American friends. I've lived in South America. I feel very comfortable with these people. I recognize, and they, the good Latinos recognize the coyotes, the people who are the predators, the drug dealers, the people who are giving them a bad name. And they're here in the United States and they're protected. One of the, my subscribers to my World Affairs Brief told me of an incident in um, uh, Libby, Montana, whereby he uh, got a, a Homeland Security brought in, I guess it was the police that captured a, a Latino drug dealer on the Indian reservation pushing. And um, he was so, he needed rehab and other things. And so he finally sent him on and uh, back to, with a prescription to get into rehab, et cetera. He called up later one of his friends in Homeland Security about what happened to this guy. And he said, oh, we, we released him. Now, he was on criminal drug charges, pushing and other things, uh, had medical problems. They released him. And he questioned them why, and he said, uh, we have orders to release them. So they're putting him back into society. Well, sure, that's like releasing the violent offenders, keeping nonviolent in to basically work for 25 cents an hour, displacing jobs outside. I mean, look at the big banks. Well, Covey and Wells Fargo got caught laundering $378 billion in drug money over two years, and they got a hundred and something million dollar fine for that. So, I mean, there it is. It's just total. How does the drug trade tie to the whole globalist system? Well, there are many aspects of the drug trade. Um, and the reason why the United States government or the dark side of the government is involved in the, dark, in, in the drug trade, one of those is to corrupt American morals. I think there's a Gramsci theory that explains why you're going to conquer a nation. If you're going to diminish the morality of a nation, you want to corrupt it through drugs. It's also a way that the dark side of government used to finance their black operations. CIA used to bring a lot of drugs in through Vietnam, whether it's body bags they were harvesting out of the Iron Triangle. In fact, former Assistant Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage used to run that for the CIA, that whole drug operation. And so this went to the very, very highest levels. We're now in Afghanistan harvesting a lot of the poppy crops, import, a lot of that's going to Europe. Plays into the global thing, uh, by, in three ways, one, corrupting American people, two, financing black operations, and three, payoffs. They're able to control a great deal of the underworld. Uh, in Afghanistan, most of the payoffs come from drug money to all of the, uh, when they buy off the Taliban, when they buy off the Iraqi opposition, for example, to make the war look like a success, they're using in-house drug money uh, to do that that's harvested out of Afghanistan. Now don't they mainly use uh, Wall Street fronts where they just pump money and insider knowledge into companies to then use profit from the companies to fund black ops? They do that too. They do that too. But then again, a lot of it now is just printed money. Uh, you know, they've got to the point now where the money supply is so big they can print a few trillion dollars here and there. In fact, the CIA has a full set of U.S. currency printing plates. They've given a set to Moscow. They've given a set to several other Governments, they're supposed to use it judiciously. But, uh, you know, we send suitcases with air couriers uh, when we go into a country to bribe officials. Suitcases of $100 bills. That well, it's actually pallets now. Pallets, I'm sorry, you're right. It's pallets. And that's why, you know, that exit from Iraq going out to Kuwait, you know, was just people with satchels full of money that they discovered. Those are the payoff money, and they're getting it out of the country in order to, you know, make themselves oligarchs of their own variety out there in the West, just like the oligarchs in Russia. The former communist leaders got the central bank to give them the loans to buy up the oil companies, to buy up the electric companies. The oligarchs became wealthy, moved offshore, and they still run. They still are the communists, and they're still running Putin and others. Putin met with Boris Berezovsky five times in his Spanish villa the year he ascended to the presidency. 
and then pretends that he's the enemy of Boris Berezovsky and that Berezovsky's trying to overthrow Putin. I mean, this is just political theater. And then it turns out that the Rothschilds sued uh, the Daily Mail saying, we're not puppet masters secretly running those oligarchs who then run the sub puppets. So it's pu puppet masters on top of puppet masters on top of puppet masters. And they lost the suit. And the judge said, wow, you really do run these people. I mean, that just happened a few months ago where it turns out that the oligarchs are still in control of Russia and the Rothschilds are sitting above them. But as I will assert, the Rothschilds don't control them. They feed money to them, they, they try to assist them, they try to cover for them, but they are co-predators maneuvering like this and playing like they're helping. But sure, believe, they're always flipping allegiances. Believe me, the oligarchs are intending to strike the West, and a lot of people who think, because they believe that if the Anglo-American establishment controls the Russians, that they'll never strike. But I'll guarantee you they will strike because they're only assisting in, in controlling it a in an arm's length relationship. Well, that's like China, where our criminal government will pay billions of dollars to move General Motors, Cadillac, and Volt to China, but then the Chinese president says, prepare for war with the United States. Because right, they don't actually control the Chinese. They're, they're trying to maneuver inside. Why did China agree to the one-child policy uh, in exchange for aid? I mean, I guess culturally, the Chinese have believed they've got too many people, other leaders have said. Well, every globalist predator center believes in controlling population. Only Russia needs population. Everyone else is trying to destroy population, China including. They've got an agenda to, to eliminate probably at least three-fourths of the world population. Well, I was about to say, from my research, eugenics is what binds the communist Chinese predators and the Anglo-American predators together. Uh, and, and, and from my research, everything is a eugenics-based obsession, both with the elite are looking for life extension and other things, but also it, it just codifies scientifically their innate hatred of fellow humans. Well, one thing that people listening to this presentation may get out of it, and I know a lot of people get discouraged and say, what hope is there if these uh, predators are so powerful and we're going to have a world war and we're all going to be destroyed? Let me make it very carefully clear that everything won't be destroyed in a nuclear war. I had someone write me after our interview that we had just a few days ago and saying, well, gee, the Earth is going to be contaminated for 40 years after a nuclear strike, and so what use is there to I said, that isn't true at all. You're confusing a meltdown of a nuclear power plant, which has all these heavy isotopes that do stay and have a half-life that lasts even a hundred years. They can be thousands of times more dirty than a, than a hydrogen bomb going on. But a hydrogen bomb is relatively clean. It's just gamma rays almost exclusively, and they're dissipated within three days, two weeks at the max. Now, if there's more than one explosion over time, you might be in a shelter a maximum of a month. You can survive. The Russians intend to survive. The Chinese intend to survive. It's a matter of preparing. And a lot of people you know, have this apathetic fatalistic attitude that I'm not going to prepare, I'd rather d die. The problem is you don't die. You get sick, you wish you were dead, but you don't die. You continue to survive, just like Hiroshima. Believe me, with a nuclear attack right over a city, the people that weren't in the actual blast zone, 80% survived. It wasn't pretty. They went through hell. They survived. But wasn't that atomic weapon um, you know, of a more primitive design and so put off more dirty? Even then... They survived, even yeah. though it was dirtier. The hydrogen bombs are much, much cleaner now. What I'm saying, it's imminently survivable. All you need is some protection overhead. What about neutron weapons? Well, neutron weapons are pure gamma rays, all right? And they're very intense. They're meant to radiate and kill. You get over 300 rads, and it becomes starts to become fatal. And normally, a neutron bomb puts out 1,000 rads per hour for enough to kill everybody within probably a five-mile circle radius. So they're very dangerous. Uh, they will use some of those in a nuclear war, but uh, it's the long-term residual fallout. There aren't enough rockets and warheads to cover everything. And sure, everything. sure. I brought up neutron because it is perfect to keep the infrastructure but only kill the humans. And they claim that they you know, decided not to build those uh, in the late 70s, but from what I've been uh, researching, that it's actually been the, built. The reason that doesn't work as a national strategy, though, is that... You just need too many of them. You, you know, you'd calculate five mile circle radiuses all over the United States to how many thousands, tens of thousands of weapons, they just don't have them. 
You can't overcome a nation with just neutron and leave the structure. You've got to decapitate the military so a nation wants to give up and not fight. That's what the Russians and Chinese are betting on. Decapitate the United States and everybody's going to give up and say, whoa, we can't defend ourselves without the U.S. military. Joel, what's the time frame after the United States is attacked? I mean, how far out do you see this happening? And how fast until the globalists reemerge and try to create this uh, counter New World Order to... Um Russia. That's a very good question. The timing is dependent on Russia and China being ready, confident enough to do the strike, confident enough of finding out enough about our weapon systems or stealing enough technology they feel they can compete. I my estimate that that's at least till 2020 and beyond, not before then. In other words, I think we have time. For example, China needs a blue water navy to control all of the area that they're going to do on the eastern uh, Pacific Rim. Uh, they are intending to wipe out America's Navy with nuclear weapons, which are very easy to do to carrier task forces. Then they plan to move theirs out and replace ours. Uh, a lot of people complain about my theory saying, well, theirs are just as vulnerable as, as ours. Not if the U.S. has been decapitated. Then it's a non-nuclear situation and you're back to maritime strength. That's what the Chinese did. But they're at least 10 years out on getting a full blue water Navy. They're Four aircraft carriers won't be completed in 2021 to 23. Now, I'm not saying that I can guarantee that the strike won't come before then. People ought to be prepared well in, in advance of that. Uh, but there, Russia and China, Russia is going to be ready much sooner than, but uh, they are really up on nuclear missiles. They, uh, you know, have hundreds more nuclear missiles of the newest Topol M variety. Uh, that they have uh, deployed in underground bases like um, Yamanto Mountain, which is a complete underground factory system. Well, that's my next point, and then I want to get deeper into your overall analysis and actual regions and show some examples of some of the death traps that are out there, like New Jersey, New York, Southern California. The main reason that I think your research has a lot of credibility is because it's one of the only theories that fits into what I see. The Chinese it's in the news, are going crazy building underground bases. Never in the Cold War do they do this at this speed. The Russians, giant bases underground everywhere. It even comes out in the press that they're just dumping massive amounts of money into this. Um, the Swiss, who've got two-year supplies for their whole population, are expanding programs. Uh, all over Europe, the elites uh, are, are, are publicly moving to islands and, and preparing and building bunkers. You know, you're in that business. You say you've never seen it expand like this. And governments are digging in. And COG is expanding and stockpiling. They are racing. And people say, well, that's because 2012. Oh, or that's because of the comment. And all this made up crud. And then you've got the seed vaults and at the North Pole and other places. And you've got... Uh, DNA arcs and, and all of this and the Rockefeller Foundation heavily involved in this, uh, they don't just build infrastructure and do things for no reason. So why are they engaged in something much bigger per nation in these power blocks than the Manhattan Project? I mean, obviously they're getting ready for something big and I mean, is it a race-specific bioweapons? Is it, is it a nuclear war? All I know is they're gearing up for something big. Well, I can tell you that race-specific bioweapons are very chancy still. Um, anytime you use biological weapons, they're really afraid this is not going to be able to control or be as discriminating. I mean, this is, they're very nervous about this. They can mutate. Well. They can mutate. It could be devastating. They prefer nuclear because this is very controllable. They know exactly what nuclear fallout will go, what it's doing, and how to protect against. It's relatively easy to protect against. That's what they're doing. Now, as to them preparing at a feverish pace and having been doing so soon, it's because their timetable as to when this war was supposed to be about now. In other words, they were planning on inducing Russia and China to strike as early as now, and it just hasn't worked. It keeps prolonging. They were doing major disarmament in the 1990s, PDD or PDD-60, where President Clinton came out in 1997, told the nuclear establishment in the United States to prepare to absorb a nuclear first strike and not launch on warning. Meaning, you may think you got the, the launch procedure and all, but you're not going to get permission to launch. That's, you know, even our military today say, no, we've got the procedure for launching on warning and for retaliating. 
I said, yeah, but you can't do that without permission. You're not gonna get permission. Well, that's right. Don't they have to give them the authentication code to then let them? So they don't really have it. They don't really have it until the White House releases the- And when did they change that? Because uh, at one time they did, right? That's right. And they changed that, so they've withdrawn all- Wasn't that under Clinton? Yes, it was. That was a big furor when he took yeah. the, the launch codes off the subs. That's right. They had movies about how the sub commanders are bad uh, in Hollywood just to even sell that. What we're going to do um, in preparing for that war is important. It is survivable. People need to prepare. and But they have to get outside blast zones. Again, you're watching Strategic Relocation, the film presentation based on the book, Strategic Relocation, by Joel Scalzo. and we're going to go back to this presentation here in just a moment. Uh, I just wanted to encourage PrisonPlanet.tv viewers, subscribers, uh, who've made so much of this possible, uh, to be sure and also download uh, a copy of this presentation and uh, give that to your friends and family, or even better, get the high-quality DVD with the expanded extras that we're not able to uh, show you uh, here tonight. I don't like how I said that. Or get the DVD, which has the expanded extras that deal with securing your home and that dovetails with the book, The Secure Home, written by Joel Skousen. Uh, also, we intend as a public service to post this uh, to YouTube at the Alex Jones channel, and I'm sure uh, change the channel and others will want to post it as well. And so I hope those of you out there watching this on YouTube uh, will support the uh, author, Joel Skousen, by buying his books uh, at InfoWarsStore.com. But more importantly, support yourself in having these Bibles of preparedness uh, that uh, any home is incomplete without. But regardless of what you do, take this YouTube video or other video system that you're watching it on and send the link to friends and family because the globalists do not want us prepared. Because if we are prepared, they're not going to be able to domesticate us and fully take over. Agenda 21 is about driving us all into the compact cities. We've all seen the UN maps that Congress was uh, shown back in the mid-90s. And, and, and now we see those maps being implemented where half the country is completely off limits. Another 40% or so is very restricted. And less than 10% is, quote, free use. This is global world government zoning. They just had the Hurricane Sandy, and I saw on local Fox News, the environmentalists said, you shouldn't be able to rebuild because buildings are bad on the beach. Well, it's about insiders only being allowed to build. So that's what this is all about, ladies and gentlemen. They want you under their control. And sure, even if you can't move to the safest zones in the U.S., there's a lot of options broken down here in this film and in the books, you can move to safer areas per capita outside your city. I commute in about 20 miles every morning. I, I live about uh, 18 miles outside Austin, and then a couple miles into Austin is my office in South Austin. And that's not the perfect place, but Joel Skousen, uh, you know, in his book, says the Hill Country is one of the safer areas or the safest area uh, per capita in Texas. But still, it's not perfect. But before I'd even read his book, I'd done my own research and decided that that was the safest area. And that's where a lot of the elite were moving as well. And sure enough, in my own research, dovetailed with his. But here's what's amazing. He knows areas all over the country because, again, he's built homes all over the country. Joel, you also in your book get into ethnicity maps and Let's face it, the globalists look at those and use the media to play groups off against each other. Take Trayvon Martin just recently. Uh, they edited audio together, the 911 call, NBC did, to make it sound like he was racist against black people. Uh, they uh, sent Justice Department people in to the new Black Panther Party, it turned out, to call for race war. So during an emergency or in a collapse, they're definitely going to try to play people off against each other. And uh, you break down maps of this uh, in your book. Tell us about it. I do cover the cultural conflict issue as well as racial and ethnicity. Uh, and I show maps that show where high density minority populations are. And I do this not because I'm racist, because I have many friends in both camps, but because those camps themselves realize that they're being manipulated by the media, by globalists. It's a very popular thing to play on, on race. 
it's not so much that they will use it, um, in my opinion, during a crisis as much as they will use it to foment crises. And they have for many, many years used the illegal alien. Uh, whenever you get a strong movement in conservatives against giving amnesty, they hit the streets. Somebody's pushing those people out on the streets. ICE goes and uh, does a raid on, and then they show all these kinds of pictures about the poor family members that are getting deported and little children are being left behind. This is meant, of course, to change law, to diminish one's ability to close the borders and have a, but ultimately, I think it's, it's wise to stay away from large uh, interculturally mixed communities, which can be used in a crisis to turn against you or to, complain, to play one race against another. Well, that's like the gangs of New York. It was all white people. You go back 150, 200 years ago in New York, but the big city crime syndicate was always playing different groups, Irish off against English, uh, Polish people off against Germans. I mean, it, it, that's what the British great game is, is divide and conquer. I mean, it, it's just that simple. And I notice on your map though, population density is also where you have those big conflagrations of different racial groups. So, so it's pretty simple reading your book, and I, and I can tell there's deep research because I've done research on specific areas, and wow, this is accurate. I mean, just amazing. But as you've told me off air, it's decades of research you're already doing, just basically concentrated down into one book. Yes, and it's it's important that people get ready to exit the high density areas. That's where all the crime is. That's where all the regulation is. That's where all of the high density urban planning is. That's where the racial tension is. People just have to plan on getting out of high density areas. Now, for the people that can't, of course, there's the strategy of living near the periphery of those things so that you're at the least density ring. You can commute into it, get out of it. We'll talk a little bit more about that, about strategy. Let's talk now about picking a safe country before we get to the analysis of uh, North America. I get a lot of calls, Alex, about uh, people wanting to leave the country. The basic philosophy, their line of reasoning is, this is where the globalist leaders are. This is where the bad guys are. They intend to do many bad things to us. They're getting ready to lock people up. They're building concentration camps. I gotta get out of the country. And so let's talk about a little about international retreating and what are the various options and opinions and, uh, and problems. One of the problems is that all of the international websites about retreating to foreign countries are run by expatriates. Expatriates are people with money who have left the country living the high life in Costa Rica or Australia and New Zealand. And it's a very deceptive point of view because things aren't gonna be like that in a crisis. You have to look strategically, think strategically about what's gonna to happen to these nations when a real crisis and are they going to be reacting the same to Americans in their presence as now. So let's look at this map and uh, talk about some of the regions of the world this is a world population density map. And you notice how high the population density is here in the Far East, in the Southern Belt, in India, China, Indonesia, all of these countries, extreme high population densities. This is not where you want to be, it's a very bad place. Europe is also a crown jewel of um, beauty in the nation, but it's extremely high density. I had a call from Czechoslovakia asking for advice about how do I implement strategic relocation or have you done advice about Europe? And I said, no, it's really a lost cause. Too high density of population to survive there well in, in a crisis. You can also see in the Americas how you have the high population density in the East. Mexico is very, very high density. So is Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Panama, um, this is the band here in, uh, from Venezuela to Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador. The bright spot in these nations is Chile and Uruguay. Now, Uruguay looks like it has a higher population density, but in fact, most of that is averaged out. It's only along the coast, very low population density here. These two countries are fairly free market and amenable to people. These nations... Costa Rica especially has a great deal of affinity towards American expatriates there, uh, but prices are rising because there are so many Americans there. What people don't realize is that in Latin America, almost all of the educated intelligentsia, bureaucrats in government are Marxists. 
and they hate Americans, especially after George Bush. So it's very difficult to count on these areas uh, accepting Americans, not taking advantage of Americans. Argentina, Mexico, and a couple of other countries, Brazil and others, have confiscated American bank accounts historically in the past. Now let's take a look at the map of economic freedom in the world. It's very telling about power economically and governmental vis-a-vis -vis liberty. This is a very, very telling map because even though population density showed that these are not heavily populated and they're not very livable like in the, in the jungles of Brazil, look at the economic freedom. These are terrible countries. Actually, China is only temporarily allowing some economic freedom, but it should be darker than this. I didn't create all of this or make the ratings. But look at Mexico, very, very highly regulatory. Costa Rica is a little bit better. Panama is a little better. Venezuela is very bad. Colombia is bad. Peru is bad, or Ecuador is bad. Uh, Peru, less bad. And Chile is almost white. Chile's the best nation of Latin America if you're going to migrate. Uruguay is next, small country not as corrupt as uh, Argentina. In fact, they play off the fact that Argentina is very restrictive about uh, many things, including controlling wealth, and so they get the overflow of people leaving Argentina. Most of the density, high density population, international crowd lives on the coast. Prices are very expensive, they're in dollars. But here in the inside interior of the country, I've lived there for a couple of years, that's a real gem. Cheap property, wonderful people, a totally different country than the high-priced coast. Um, there's nothing in Africa that I recommend. This is an anomaly in terms of economic re uh, freedom. It's actually just anarchy, and I don't consider that a very good bet for economic freedom. Europe, as you can see, has some economic freedom. This matches my highest recommendation in Europe, is Spain, in terms of a livable country. A lot of expat communities, Brits especially that have located down on the Mediterranean side of Spain. But Spain has a good friendly people, wide ranging agriculture. And if you'll notice, like in the movie, The Great Escape, when everyone wanted to leave Europe in a problem, they went through Spain. So Spain's my top pick in Europe. Australia has a fair amount of economic freedom. But once again, the problem with Australia and New Zealand Twofold, very difficult to get in and get residency, make you pay a lot of money. The Australians have sold out to the Chinese interests. Almost all of their national resources have been bought or have contracted to China. I was reading National Geographic was bragging that 98% or something of all their mines and rare earth minerals are Chinese run as if that was a good thing to have Australia now a satellite economically of the chai -coms. But I can guarantee you that China will occupy Australia during the next war to make sure that they secure those things. And so if you want to live under Chinese occupation, it may be very similar to Japanese occupation. The Orientals are pretty ruthless, have very little regard for human life uh, as a philosophy. Uh, historically speaking, they have been the worst abusers of human rights in general against whole populations during wartime. So it doesn't speak well of retreating to these two countries, I think they'll also take New Zealand just because it's too close uh, to, the, um, to Australia. Canada is my second best bet after the United States. The reason I'm still bullish on the United States as a retreat international location is because it's got the highest per capita density of liberty-oriented, freedom-educated people in the entire world. The problem in living in Latin America is that they're friendly to Americans now generally, but if ever the government clamps down and the globalists who control this country and Canada put out the word to control American expats or send them home, you're gonna find that those countries will comply. They are yes men to the globalist establishment. Canada, only advantage toward the United States is millions of square miles of wide open spaces to the north, though the climate is more hostile. Uh, the only acceptable strategy I find is living in border areas where you can go back and forth depending on what you need. That's fairly easy to do in uh, between Canada and the United States. I exclude the eastern portion of Canada because all of the cities, about 90% of Canadians live within 50 miles of the American border. 
and thus be, they become extensions of the American cities. How does Alaska tie in or Hawaii? Obviously, Hawaii is not a place to be. Hawaii, I give a zero rating, uh, the lowest rating possible because it is an island, because it's far away from the mainland. And I believe it's possible if there is occupation in the United States during war, it's going to be Hawaii that gets occupied. It's a strategic outpost for military adventurism, and the, uh, the Chinese would be foolish not to take it. So it's a possibility that, Chinese, or that China could occupy Hawaii. But in any case, even if it gets cut off, I've lived in Hawaii. I know that it depends on shipping every week to bring in food, gasoline. You're going to be out of those things. Even though Kauai is my choice of an island if you have to live in Hawaii because it can be self-sufficient. Oahu is not self-sufficient agriculturally. The big island is self-sufficient. Um, and so Kauai or Hawaii are the, the best places to be. But I'm afraid as in any island that it could be surrounded and occupied and you just simply can't get off the island if you need to. Now, Alaska is a very interesting uh, case. I downgrade Alaska even though you could be self-sufficient there in the southern panhandle up through Anchorage, but it's still a very hostile environment. Uh, it's like an island. Everything has to be shipped into Alaska and it's very, very difficult to leave if it should become untenable to live there. This is not easy to get down through the Alcan Highway. So it doesn't have lines of retreat. It doesn't have lines of retreat. So the only place I recommend, or the only way I recommend for Alaskans is those that are very, very skilled survivalists who can live in the boondocks throughout the winter, apart from society. If you're capable of doing that, then I... Let me throw some wild cards at you. What about Iceland? What about Greenland? Uh, what about uh, you know, islands that are out in the middle of nowhere, just as just as bad as Hawaii. Uh, actually, uh, Greenland is worse. There's only a few pockets of civilization on Greenland that survive, even in the best of times, and they once again depend on absolute shipping for everything. They don't grow anything there. Iceland depends on everything being shipped in as well. Iceland has recovered from its globalist banking nightmare simply by stiffing the globalists. But if you look 10 years from now, you'll find that they'll be penalized and cut off. Uh, they, by reneging on their debt, have got a fairly self-sufficient economy right now. But because it is a socialist economy, they'll be back in the piggy bank, negative piggy bank state, probably within a decade. So I don't recommend Iceland as well. It's just, everything is extremely socialistic in Europe and they're starting to have a backlash right now against the globalists like Sarkozy in France. He's going to lose this next election. So to be clear, from my analysis, the only people that would want to flee the United States is if you're a big fish politically like myself, yourself, Ron Paul or somebody, if it's going to full Soviet-style globalist roundup, taking us to a camp, if we could foresee that happening, we would try to get out of the country or maybe go to a rural retreat, but they might come after us there. But for everybody else, if you really look at it, the United States has the most people that are awake. It's where the fortunes of the planet will rise or fall. And my instinct, my gut, my discernment is stay in the United States and fight it out here. And by fight it out, I mean occupy the land, be here, educate people, uh, and uh, dig in and hope for the best, but also prepare for the worst. I really agree with that analysis, Alex. Uh, if you're going to live, high-profile people, I speak multiple languages. I've done that on purpose so that I can go to other countries. One of the reasons why I prefer Uruguay uh, is because there's a lot of uh, Europeans there. I can blend in there. I can't blend in in Peru or Colombia. Uh, just don't blend in very well when you're pure Caucasian. Uh, but it's very important to get native language speed if you're going to try to blend into those countries because someday, you know, there will be a roundup of Americans. There will be confiscation of properties. There's a lot of Americans here in little enclaves in Mexico. Jesse Ventura. Yeah, and I think that's a, a dead place for Americans. I'll tell you, the crime is very, very bad. The corruption, you can't depend on any kind of safety there. Uh, staying in the American enclaves, they'll eventually be raided and... Uh, so you think the Baja is a death trap? Yeah, I think it's a death trap. So don't judge these countries because you have American enclaves that are living the high life right now. I can guarantee you that will not survive.
Uh, so, well, they're going to be ripe for the picking. Yeah, ripe for the picking. And uh, when Mexicans are out of things and uh, if the druggies don't get you, uh, you know, the criminal elements within... Well, in Mexico, they're already killing all the middle-class people and are, are kidnapping them right now. And that will get only worse. Kidnapping was the bane of Central America, El Salvador, Guatemala, uh, went through a lot of kidnapping. I was down there in the 80s when that was occurring, stayed at a house with bloodstains still on the wall from the owner being kidnapped, ransomed, paid the ransom, he was killed anyway. Believe me, this is kidnapping haven and it will happen once again. It is, has only just begun. And just to be clear, your knowledge in these subjects is amazing because I do deep research, I'm obsessed with knowledge. And uh, I mean, so much of what I read in the book that I have firsthand knowledge of is very accurate. Like you rate in Texas, the Hill Country, which I chose outside Austin is not perfect, but if you're looking at Texas, that's one of the better places. That's right, and we'll cover that. We're gonna talk about Texas and give you some examples of specific states. Um, do we have the map on the corruption uh, index on uh, internationally? So here's the map on the cor corruption index internationally. What I wanna point out to you in strategic relocation there's lots of maps like this in the book. This is almost identical to the economic freedom map. In other words, there's a high correlation between economic freedom, of which you see very little of. The dark areas are the unfree areas. And you'll notice here that um, uh, the Sudan is not, uh, has a high level of corruption, and that's why it was an anomaly to be economic freedom. It's the uh, uh, corruption and the anarchy there. But that's about the only analogy it's like Los Eisley Spaceport in Star Wars. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's a very good analysis. Okay, from now on, let's move into analysis of the factors that we discussed. Let me discuss something about the organization of the book. After we cover section one, which is about how to find a safe nation, then we go into an analysis of North America, which is my preferred area for North Americans because they blend in even though we're gonna have a great deal of tyranny here, our chances of being able to blend in, disappear, go underground are higher, being that we have a great, uh, many millions of people that can help support us in that. So what I do is I go through the various threats that you face, and we talk about climate. These are preferences of what you wanna uh, live in in terms of wind, if you want wind power, how to look for those things. There are maps in this book that cover every one of these details. We talk about the economy. We talk about crime. There are crime statistics. We have ratings of every city uh, in every state on crime, and we talk about the different types of crime that there are. We talk about natural disasters. Let me show the map on uh, tornadoes and hurricanes to give you an example of graphics that we have demonstrating a natural disaster. Now, I'm going to demonstrate two of the graphics that we have showing the natural disaster threats. The first one is earthquake hazards. You can see that there's major earthquake hazard on the west coast in the Rocky Mountains. That's Yellowstone Park area, which has a volcanic hazard. Well, this is the new Madrid fault, and these are other minor faults coming through the south uh, east. Now, it's interesting that this map doesn't mean that everything is never necessarily devastated if you're in any of these high earthquake areas. What I point out in the book is you have to look at the actual ground conditions in the area that you're at. For example, in the state of Utah, where you have a high fault area that's expected to go off at some time in the future, it's on a 300 year cycle approximately. If you are in the low lying valley, next to a lake where you have a high water table, you'll get a wave action, an earthquake, which will actually flip houses in the air and be very, very destructive. If you're on a foothill coming out of the mountains, even closer to the fault line, but on sand and gravel, broad-based, the house will merely shake a little bit, but it won't take up any wave action. I give this out as an example in the book, how just because you're in an earthquake area doesn't mean you can't find safe areas to build upon. Remember, it's water table that's your danger in an earthquake. That's going to set up wave action. Let's go to the tornado map. Now, this is a graphic of the tornadoes in the United States. It's very graphic because these represent the larger the triangles, the heavier the tornado. This is the danger zone. These are where your F5 type tornadoes. We did have some F5s come through this area, which were devastating to the southeast and pour through here. 
I've spent a lot of time recently in North Georgia and seen the damage from these tornadoes. It is horrendous what these things can do. The good news is that there's no reason why you should ever be at risk of your life in a tornado area. Buildings, yes, although you can design tor uh, tornado proof up to a level four, nothing's guaranteed in an F5 tornado. But with a proper safe room built into your basement structure, there's no reason why you can't survive any tornadoes. This is part of what I call the amelioration strategy or contingency strategy. You can overcome some of these threats like earthquake by building stronger, flexible construction and tornadoes. And that's an example of old timers having storable food, having firearms, just as a matter of course, they all had storm cellars. And then, oh, that's stupid to have, so people just wait and get killed now. Things really change. In the past, if there was a threat, people made a preparation for it. And it would double as a seller for their canned goods or whatever. I remember after our recent interview uh, on uh, Infowars.com that I got an email from someone in California and laughing about our interview saying, I remember the 60s when my father talked about everyone having a fallout shelter. And he was in the military and he said, we don't need any of that. That's never gonna happen here. And I responded to him, well, just remember, you've been warned when it happens, not my fault that you weren't prepared. But my point is if you live in Tornado Alley, like people in North Texas or in Kansas or Missouri or Oklahoma, and you know about the hundreds killed every year, just because you have a storm cellar doesn't mean that you think you're gonna be hit. It's just, it's there as a backup. That's right, and the advantage, by the way, of building a secure home in these areas is that when you do a high security safe room in a basement with a concrete cap over it, you can tell the building department if you're in an area that requires building permits that this is a storm shelter. You have that excuse. You don't have that excuse in areas where there aren't tornadoes. And so it does allow you to avoid talking about having a high security room and of course, when we design these, we make sure that we don't design all the details into the plans. You simply put a box uh, in concrete and you don't put any of the facilities and you call it storage or you call it a tornado shelter. And then you put in the detailed equipment, which would make it obvious what its purpose is after the building permit process is through. I want to build a concealed fallout bunker. I recommend that everything be concealed. As I pointed out in my World Affairs brief, Obama's uh, executive order uh, detailing to federal agencies the confiscation of natural resources and foodstuffs in an emergency is based upon the National Defense Production Act of 1950. And even though that commandeering power has been removed and re repealed in 2009, it'll be back at some other point at an appropriate crisis. But still in the National Production Act of 1950 is the statement about hoarding. If you are caught storing food or having stored food after it's been declared a scarce resource, you're guilty of a year in jail or penalty of $10,000 a day. So it is important, my point is, to have concealment because someday I can guarantee you that government will come to call for your hard-earned stored materials and confiscate them unless you've got them concealed. What about these buried capsules that I've seen, uh, like in movies like The Road, but I know they really sell them, where it's just a hatch and it's basically like a buried uh, you know, gasoline drum type system like they'd have at a gas station underground. You know, you have the hole dug, then you have somebody place it, you cover it up. I mean, just for absolute emergencies. Is that one of the more inexpensive ways? It is, in one way, more inexpensive, but it's practically, uh, as a practical matter, something I don't recommend. And the reason is, it takes a lot of in and out of the, one of those holes to stockpile something. The chances of you doing that without anyone seeing you or getting to it when you want to without somebody seeing you out in an open field or even if it's got a few bushes around it, very difficult to do. That's why I always recommend, whether it's a concrete cellar uh, a hidden room. facility under the house. That's right. Under the house, under a shed, under a barn, so that you can drive into it, unload in privacy, rather than doing something out in the open. Uh, even these self-contained bomb shelters, they call them, and I don't think most people need them because they have all these blast valves. If you need blast valves, you're in a blast zone. 
move. Spend the money to move. Yeah, you don't want an armored structure like next door to the military base that's going to be hit by all the I ice. Mean, why spend $60,000, $75,000 for an armored shelter that is variable when you're in a blast zone? If you're in a blast zone, you move. You spend that money to relocate where you don't need the blast valve, you don't need the expensive, and then you can build a regular concrete But again, even structure. if people don't think that there's going to be a staged nuclear attack, the map's all overlay. Uh, you know, the population density, all of it, the rural areas for economic collapse, everything, they're the place to be. That's right. But one additional problem with these in-ground type shelters that don't have building over them is you have these vent stacks coming out of the ground, which can be sabotaged. And a lot of people don't understand that a vent is like a microwave conduit communication changer. You can sit there and hear everyone whispering in the smallest tone of voice inside a shelter if you can get close to one of those vents. What about a redoubt built up in the side of a hill, trees in front of it? It can have like ports for guns, all of that. Well, the point is it's still vulnerable because your ventilation shafts are tamperable uh, unless you go to extreme uh, concealment. Couldn't you run them out in front of you? Well, you would still have to have them come out into the air. That means you've got to put them into a hollow stump or something so that they're, it's very difficult to do. It's much easier to disguise it within a, an existing building. So they go through the building, the vents are in the walls, they come up into the attic spaces where they can't be seen, or they come up through chimney systems so that nobody can get close to them to hear anything that's going on inside. What's a moderate price one versus the high end you've built? People can build a, um, in a basement structure underneath a garage, for example, with a thickened slab, uh, the basic structure for less than $10,000. All right, so the other threads that we, we talk about in the book, and remember in this section of the book, we're taking each of the threats expansively, talking about how do you ameliorate the threat, et cetera, where, which states have threats. And then when we get into the state analysis, which is this next section, which is the biggest part of the book, we give you a summary rating for every one of those threats so that you've talked about them in general and crime in general and what the various statistics. And then when you decide, all right, I'm gonna consider going to Idaho, what do those threats look like? You have in this book um, an example of, and let's, let's start with California. Whatever you do, get some food, get some water, learn how to use a firearm, and most importantly, get your mind right, get your heart right with God, and meet like-minded people in your area that understand we're under a private, corporate, tyrannical world government that wants to bankrupt us and wants us in compact cities where they can forcibly inoculate us, take our children, put us in re-education camps. That army manual four months ago got declassified where they call it re-education camps, even using the authoritarian term. Uh, first, it was 1 billion bullets they bought this year, then 1.2, then 1.4, then 1.6 billion bullets. Uh, TSA checkpoints, it's all happening. It's all unfolding, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. The federal courts are ruling they can put cameras in your yard without telling you without warrants, or police dogs can come break in your house without warrants. I mean, it, it's crazy. And so we need to get prepared, just like the French Resistance did. We need to understand we're dealing with very, very dangerous people. And we may have to go underground uh, if they stage a nuke or something and blame it on domestic groups and try to come arrest everybody. But by admitting how criminal the government is, we may be able to back them off. So we offensively try to wake everybody up and try to politically resist this but we defensively also have a backup strategy plan. And that's what Strategic Relocation, third edition, the book, and the new film, Strategic Relocation, are all about. Secure your copies at InfoWarsStore.com today. We now return to Strategic Relocation. In California, uh, this is an example of how we rate each one of the Threats. You go through, and they're delineated here, you have the climate, you have a synopsis of the climate. You have a synopsis of the density population and how many people per square mile average in the state. You have a cost of living index, tells you how expensive it is. California is very high. You have a private land availability discussion. So we know how much of the land is private versus federal. Most of your western states have up to 50 to 70% of the land in federal hands. Uh, 
We have a discussion about building codes. These are things that you get in no other analysis, no other book has ever covered this kind of detail. It's a analysis. full spectrum breakdown from every angle, no matter where you are. Let's say you gotta stay there, it gives you the best areas even in that subregion. For example, building codes are very important because if you're in a very onerous area with a lot of building codes where they wanna know everything about your building, it's very difficult to conceal the secret things that you're gonna have because you've gotta have some plumbing pipes down there in that secure room. You label it storage and an intrusive building department starts to say, what's this plumbing for? If you're gonna have a bathroom there, you've gotta have windows in this area. If you don't have you know, windows, it's not habitable and we'll come in and inspect to make sure you don't habitate it. They don't have a code uh, you know, a good code for fallout shelters and you wouldn't want to uh, declare them anyway. So building code section is very important. Some states actually have counties that don't require building codes. There are some in Texas, there are some in Idaho, there are some in New York that started all this building code in rural areas and rural counties. But I also point out in the building codes uh, section of the book that you wanna watch for states that have a uniform statewide building code. That means no matter how rural the county's required to have a building code in the building department. If you don't have a statewide code, then most counties are able to say, we're not gonna do that. And basically that's Agenda 21. It's global standardized coding. And, and you find out in these states that do that, it's federal, but really that's international. That's exactly right. So then we talk about food production. What's the length of the growing season? How capable are you versus altitude, soil, and other things? The health environment. We talk about pollution, the water quality. Uh, we talk about traffic. You know, just nobody has all of this criteria in their analysis of the, the competing books. Uh, what the traffic are in the key metros, um, because that really affects your ability to get out of Dodge when you need to. We give a political rating, how liberal, how conservative the state is. We talk about taxes. We give a synopsis. There's a whole chapter on taxes. Which are the no income tax states? What are the income tax rates? What are the overall spending of the states? Some states spend double per capita uh, that other states do, like New Jersey is one of the worst states. And so we give a rating on taxes. We give a corruption rating. And this was very difficult to ferret out to research. Uh, very difficult because most corruption is concealed but we were able to ferret out some pretty good corruption ratings for each state. We give crime ratings on the state. Personal liberty ratings, we rate it from one to five. California is low. We give a gun liberty rating. California is terrible. One of the few states we gave a terrible rating to. No permit to purchase firearms. Any rifle with a magazine is banned as an assault weapon. Registration is required for all pre-ban weapons. No out-of-production guns may be brought into the state, including vintage weapons. It has a may issue, uh, effectively a no issue, concealed weapons permit from the sheriff's office, and no recognition of other state concealed weapons permits. That's the kind of detail that is really helpful in picking a state when you want to. Talk about a death trap, though. I mean, Southern California, if things unravel in any way, it, it is gonna look like absolute hell. That's right, but I'll tell you, California is a mix in that regard. It's got some very good retreat areas if it wasn't that it's in California. It's in the socialist state of the union. It's in the most highly regulated state of the union. And yet it's got some beautiful areas in the Sierra Mountains and things. And we'll talk about that when I show you the map. We talk about alternative medicine. This is very important. A lot of people keep asking me and says, are you going you know, tell us how to get our meds? And I said, forget your meds. Meds are not gonna be had in a crisis. Learn to use alternative medicine now and get into states which allow alternative medicine because then that little mini industry isn't stifled. You have naturopaths, you have chiropractors who know how to prescribe good nutrition, etc. cetera. Uh, I talk about homeschooling freedom. This is going to be very important. Another thing on alternative medicine you need to be aware of is that hospitals someday are going to become a a screening filtering mechanism to screen out homeschoolers, screen out people who believe in discipline, because- They already admit that. They say it's gonna be the new tyranny to enforce all the surveillance. And vaccinations and those, and it's very deadly. California just passed a law where they vaccinate kids without parental consent. I mean, that that's like red alert exodus. And so what I'm saying is alternative medicine and lay midwifery freedom in a state is very important because the ability to have children outside of a hospital with a trained lay midwife is very important to avoiding the trap, the stamp of, 
You know, we have known stories of women who have said, I don't want vaccines. They take their baby away to the nursery and they come back, oh, we forgot we vaccinated your child. Or they try to have CPS take them. And that's what's so amazing is how deep the tyranny's already gotten. And someday there's gonna be a litmus test whether or not they'll give your baby back from the nursery. You've got a sign that you don't believe in uh, cruel and unusual discipline like spanking, uh, you know, that you'll have them vaccinated and they won't give your baby unless you sign on the dotted line. So. Someday, I believe that freedom-loving people are going to have to stay out of the public schools. They should be out of them already, frankly, and they're going to have to stay out of the hospital system. And that means learning to be healthy, learning alternative medicine, good nutrition. Well, I think it's important to exodus the major cities to create communities of liberty and freedom already. I mean, why, why wait? Why wait for the threat of biological weapons or collapse? We should be getting the hell out of here to begin with. But realistically, a lot of people still have to stay close enough to live. A lot of people don't have the liberty of husband and wife. It takes at least a full-time job for a husband and wife to teach at home. So I am- The globalists did that on purpose. I understand the limit, uh, limitations, and I realize one of the reasons they made it tough economically is to get the women in the workforce to degrade the family and those types of things. But I think if you work hard, if you read through the section on contingency planning and how to, you know, you can work through and start to make progress towards getting out of this kind of society and the traps that they're doing. The last section of detailed knowledge in each state is the military targets. We list every military target in the states, including Naval, uh, Army, Air Force, and we list the nuclear plants. Nuclear plants are particularly dangerous because when they do meltdown or if they get hit with a nuclear bomb or nearby and they're damaged and, and meltdown, they are much more dangerous than a nuclear weapon in terms of the residual fallout, the long-term effects of fallout. Then in addition, after the detailed summaries from the threat section, we give specific notes, my personal experience about being in every one of these states, as well as I, in my blog on uh, uh, joelskousen.com, I've had people contribute what their experience is living in the states. And then one of the most the valuable sections of the book is city-state specific strategies, or city-specific strategies, meaning for every major metro area in every state, I go through and explain where are the best places relative to that metro area to relocate relative to the outflows of refugees and how to avoid the bad areas. Of so this is a sub-strategy. If you can't afford to move out in the middle of nowhere immediately, you find those pockets that are nearby to the major metro areas. And I point out the areas that are away from the refugee flows and the specific areas around the city. This is very valuable information. Nobody else does it. So many of the other survival communities simply says, get out, there's no other choice. You're gonna die if you stay. I have to be more realistic. I've lived with this. I've worked with people for 40 years consulting and building residences, I realize that even the best intentioned person who believes like you and I sometimes can't leave, and I want to provide the information that allows well, I, them to I survive. I need to be in a major city to be able to find a pool of skilled people to do what I do in the media, to be on the offense, not just on the defense, but you're on the offense while you're building the defense as well. That way you're not all offense or all defense. Exactly. Now let's go to the California map, and we'll tell you what one of these beautiful graphics looks like. I show in each of these graphics the nuclear targets in the adjoining states as well as within the state itself. And I show the predominant wind direction of those particular targets. Um, you can see that states, uh, areas like San Diego, that's really a dead city. As beautiful as it is, that's where I was born. But with all of the military bases there, multiple targets, nuclear weapons there, that city's going to be toast. Long Beach is still a target in Los Angeles, and there's a few others. Vandenberg Air Force Base, where the missile uh, rocket launches are. There's a few around San Francisco. Um, and I also show in color, these are the blue military reservations within the state. We show land use planning, state and national and federal forest. Why is that important? Because when you're saying, I want to go to the mountains, you've got to realize that you're going to have to get up close to that, but you can't necessarily get in there unless you find what's called an inholder property. And the danger of inholder properties is that the environmental movement eventually wants the government to throw out everyone that's actually surrounded. They're doing that everywhere. They are. I know people in Minnesota, they've been there for over 100 years, their family, they're trying to take it. These are just the most, well, they're communists. That's right. So you have to be careful of that. I recommend generally that you get up along the edge of these, and there's lots of private land in these areas. 
Uh, California has some beautiful retreat areas, abundant water, beautiful forests. They make for good vacation retreat cabins. Their only problem is you have these high density population areas and they're all heading for the hills when something happens. So the chances of getting overwhelmed are good. Better chances of re uh, reversing that are to get on the backside of the Sierras so that people have to get over the mountains to get to you. That cleans out and, and reduces a lot of the people. That, it's like a filter. That's right. It's like a filter. And so in terms of finding retreats in California, for example, people in San Diego need to get back up here in the foothills. There's a lot of property in these areas. Um, even though it looks totally green, there's a tremendous amount of private land in that area. And you get behind the mountains so that your blast zone protected. You can survive in those areas and commute into the area. One of the interesting things that I point out in another part of my book, however, is that for people who have to live in the LA Basin, San Diego Basin, if you decide to get out, if you're reading my World Affairs Brief and you get advance warning, you get out, you have to get all the way over into Arizona in order to get up to safe areas because there's only one road out of this and it goes through Las Vegas, one road, also Interstate 95, which goes up there and there's a lot of military targets. And so in order to clear into a safe area like Utah, which is a five-star state, you've got to get clear over here past Phoenix or bypass and go up into Flagstaff and get up around the Grand Canyon also one road. That's how tenuous it is to get to safe locations from this Southern California area. You got 30 plus million people in California. Right. So you see, it's very difficult. One of the strategies that I recommend for uh, people who are young enough to learn is to learn how to become a pilot. Being able to fly out of these areas is a great strategy. And uh, it's an industry that's going down. Uh, so there's a lot of room, a lot of people hungry to train you and fly you, and it's, it takes a little bit of money, but generally you can get a pilot's license for less than $5,000. So that's another strategy. Let's talk about a safe state now. Let's go to Idaho. Before we go to the Idaho map, I want to go to a general map of the United States to show some strategic value of areas in the east and the west and why Utah and Idaho end up being so highly rated. As we remember, we talked about population densities are extremely high, in this eastern area. And in fact, it extends completely over to about halfway through the, mid, uh, the states of, uh, in the middle of the country. A lot of people out here in the farmland as well. Because of that high population density, none of these states rate anything above three in the east coast. Tennessee is the highest rated state because it's got the Cumberland Plateau. There's this big Appalachian mountain chain here, which kind of is a blocking area for the major population center here. The Cumberland Plateau in Tennessee is a high thousand foot plateau. People will tend to infiltrate through the mountains, through the valley, over the mountains, through the valleys. And when they get into the Tennessee valleys, they're very tempting to stay in the valleys. Nobody wants to climb up a thousand foot plateau where there's not a lot of people. That's one of the reasons why this is very good. For the Northeast, they need uh, there's this northeast region of the wooded areas of Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, and upstate New York. Those are the only safe areas. The problem strategically is that once you retreat up there, you're stuck. If it becomes untenable, you can't get back west because these population flows will flow this way and cut off any retreat unless you go up through Canada if one wants to try to get further west if this becomes untenable. The major po refugee flows coming out of the East Coast will be in this population area here. They'll head out through Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Some will go north along that. Some will go south this way, trying to avoid the mountains. And that's why we give a lower rating to the Southeast states, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. They'll also have all of the refugees flowing out of Florida. This is a zero rated state as well because it's untenable for survival of this amount of population, and most people will tend to flee south and then west towards Louisiana and Texas. So that's gonna make Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama a disaster zone. Right. The only good areas that I recommend in these southeastern areas are the northern hill, uh, hill country and mountainous areas. The Ozarks of Arkansas are a good area, southern Missouri, 
that's the primary destination. Yeah, a lot of the elites Midwest. are building bunkers in that area. That's right, they are. Um, the the great advantage that the West has, the far West. Now these are your troubled areas here, where your population densities are. But centering around Salt Lake City, for example, even though you this is not a recommended area itself, and you can see there's a military target in Hill Air Force Base as well as the new um, NSA. Uh, computer center, data center there, which makes another additional target. The greatness of the Intermountain West is that you're surrounded by 500 miles of mountains or deserts that keep people from Denver, Los Angeles, San Francisco, or, or Seattle from getting across those deserts without gasoline, electricity, and other infrastructure. You're not going to walk across those things, I can guarantee you. That's a huge filter. It's a huge filter, and that's why this is the safest zone here in the West. What's the sweet spots? Where do you live? All right. I live in Utah here and south of this zone here, which I consider the southern and central part of Utah safer than the north because you're cut off from this uh, area here. How is the gorgeous uh, areas around Monument Valley down here in the south? Yes, these are all the Red Rock country of Utah, and the beauty of Red Rock country is that they're desert. There's very few people you can survive. The mountains provide the reservoirs of water. There are rivers coming out of all of those mountains, and if you uh, can get water, even though it cannot sustain a great deal of population in these areas, you want that to be a filter. You want people to think, I'm not going to Utah because there's no water. Well, there is water for those that are already there, and, uh, and there are high-altitude mountains for retreat cabins, which become very inaccessible in excess of uh, seven to 10,000 feet where you can get up where very few people can hike and get to. And they're forested here. Now, Colorado has some of the same terrain, but the problem is Denver is a major New World Order center. There's a major concentration camp uh, being prepared in Denver. There are secret bunker systems under the Denver airport. There are black helicopter bases out of Buckley Air Force Base in uh, Colorado. And just a few miles down the road is Colorado Springs. And Colorado Springs, Cheyenne Mountain. I don't know why the powers that be moved NORAD out of Cheyenne Mountain into Peterson Air Force Base. It makes the city an obliterated target. And I have recommended everyone in Colorado Springs who hears my voice needs to be relocated, but they're not there because the powers that be have made a major Air Force Base within the city as a target. Omaha, Nebraska, of course, is off at Air Force Base. That's the alternate Cheyenne Mountain um, here. And that's where all of the powers the be went during the 9-11. That's where the president went. That's where Warren Buffett had all of the CEOs, top CEOs from the World Trade Center at Offutt Air Force Base. You can't tell me that they didn't know what was coming on. Now, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming are... Uh, to a certain extent, in many regards, better than Utah. I gotta stop you, how weird is that? It was in the news that they had hundreds of these top people, before it even happened, they were all there for a special announcement. What was said in that hangar? What was done? I mean, do they say, look, you've seen what's happened, get in line? I mean, that, that talk about bizarre. It is, unfortunately, nobody's talked, we don't know. Uh, they won't give a list of who was there, although we do know that some of the CEOs that survived were at off at Air Force Base. Yeah, who, who would have been in the World Trade Centers That's that right. day? right, who would have been in the World Trade They had advance notice. Now, I'm not saying that everyone who left knew what was happening to the World Center, but certainly Buffett knew. Uh, certainly, he's shown himself to be an insider player. And that's the excuse to get him out. And plus, they're acting secretive about it. That shows you something was going that's on. That's right. So there are some advantages to being to the north uh, in more hostile climate in terms of, and this is the area right here, which Jim Rawls of the Survival Blog has his redoubt, which he feels is the safest area, but that's from a military standoff point of view. I don't subscribe necessarily to that for most people. Very few people are capable of engaging in a military standoff. Uh, I also give high credence to areas that have a high population base of people of the Mormon faith because they're preparedness oriented. They have a lot of food storage, a lot more than the population in general. Shifting gears, I noticed Montana and North Dakota has incredible nuke strike points. Uh, that's right. These are where your missile fields are still remaining in the United States, and that's why I give a very poor rating to anything in this area here. 
but there's a mountain range separating this safe area here, and that is not a, a missile strike area, that's a, um, a Bureau of Land Management area here, but this is where Pastor Chuck Baldwin went with his people, Whitefish, Montana, Kalispell, Montana. Uh, it's a very good area. The problem with these areas, they are very safe, they are a long distance away from, um, how should I say, uh, civilization. So you gotta take two hops to get to a major port like Seattle or other place where you can fly out. So if you're running a business, if you have to travel, that's why for most people, this area around Salt Lake City, even though I don't recommend the city itself, this area is much more user-friendly in terms of sure. uh, getting- Moving quickly, to, yeah. tell me about the Midwest. Tell me about Austin, where we're at. Tell me about- All right, so Texas, uh, and what I really need to do is shift to a different map here. These are the safe areas outlined in, in yellow here. And let's talk about Texas a little bit. We have accentuated, this has been enhanced graphically to show population in red. Every one of these dots are thousands of people. And what we've shown here is like an arterial system, this is where your danger zones are, where large population centers are. San Antonio is a large one. Dallas Fort Worth is the largest. Houston is a large one here. And you have to realize that those population centers, when these cities die through cutoff of supplies and infrastructure, are going to get out in the internet. Most people are going to try to follow roads to get to a place where they have relatives, where they know other people. They're not going to make it. The freeways are going to be cro uh, crowded. They're going to run out of gasoline. They're going to run out of food. And then they're going to start to go north and south of those freeways. And that's why these areas here are away from those patterns. Uh, this in the south uh, east Texas area, the pine forest, this is beautiful country around Palestine, Texas, etc. Yeah, yeah, we've got a ranch right there. Yeah. There's a lot of beautiful land here, but there's a lot of little towns there. In other words, well, when, uh, when hurricanes hit, uh, they had one uh, a few years ago, crime exploded as everybody got flushed out of Houston and literally the millions of illegals, that was one of the big big problems, they just, it just poured up into these areas. But a bunch of people got shot when they were trying to rob and stuff, but it was a crime wave up here as everybody got driven out of Houston when it flooded. So these are what I would call macro recommendations, meaning these are general areas where you wanna find specific. It doesn't mean that everything is as safe as everything else here. I give specific recommendations in the book of how to find specific safe properties. It's just if you're going to be in Texas, here are safer areas. That's or, right. Here are bug out routes. Right. These are the areas, and these are the dangerous areas that you don't want to be anywhere near close. Remember, you can look at these as pockets of high density people that when things are cut off, they suddenly triple their size, and everything around that becomes compromised as they expand out to look for food. So even though you may right now have a real nice piece of property outside of, uh, of Austin, if you're 20 minutes away, the chances are it's going to get overwhelmed at some point. So you need a leapfrog strategy for minor, moderate catastrophes. You can survive 20 minutes out, but then you need a cabin out there in the hill country further on that's out there so far that nobody's going to walk to it. That's the basic strategy. And as you see in this of the Midwest here, you see these huge areas, Detroit and Chicago and Columbus and Cincinnati. And even though there's a lot of rural and you drive through those areas and you think, gee, this is still very rural, you've got to look at these depictions that we've made of how dense these populations are. And when they spread out, all of these areas around those are going to be compromised. And so you have to be pretty far away to even have any chance of surviving. And you're much better off when you start getting further west where it gets and just watch what the elites do. It's on the news. They're building bunkers and castles and armored redoubts in the Ozarks. That's right. I mean, it, it, it's amazing. And I know you've built some of these homes or advised on them. That's right. Uh, so let's go to Idaho then. If you want to bring up uh, the map of Idaho, and we'll talk about a safe state and some specific areas in this. Now, Idaho has... Boise here, which is the only economically viable area for people who have high income jobs, uh, technical jobs. Boise is kind of a new technical center. This is a beautiful farming valley along the Snake River. Good areas on either side of this. This is all irrigated farmland. This is a little better out here in terms of um, 
being away from the main freeways, very few people come up this way. But this is a beautiful retreat area here. Lots of farmlands here. This is Jackson Hole over here, which is not a good area. But this is a beautiful mountain and forested area here where lots of high mountain cabins, and yet you can grow crops down here in this area. This, however, is, this shows how I point out in the book, climate plays a role. This is the rocky chain coming down here, and then it goes down into Utah. Your cold mountain air from Canada comes sweeping down in here and you get some very severe cold winters. These areas are almost 15 degrees warmer in the winter than these areas because these mountains keep this cold air from coming back into this area. This is a banana belt here in Idaho around Lewiston. One of the top retreat areas here is along the Nez Perce River. This is where Kuskia is. This is the Nez Perce Indian Reservation, which I don't recommend you get on because of the sensitivity of minorities taking back their land, even if they come tracked with you. But here you get Columbia River, moist northwest air. You get trees growing down at the 2,500 foot level, conifer trees, whereas here in the high mountain and in Utah, you don't get conifers up till 6,000 feet. It takes snow to melt to grow conifers. But here you get enough rain from the northwest coming over that you have a microcosm. This is like northwest climate clear up here into the panhandle of Idaho. Uh, a lot of beautiful areas here, Boundary County, around Sandpoint, Idaho, no building codes up in Boundary County. This is where Hayden Lake is, where the Aryan Nation was. They have been rooted out. This was a government uh, operation of uh, playing like they were neo-Nazis. Uh, they had hired Pastor Butler to run that organization, but uh, they're cleared out now and gone. So this is healing I don't normally ever recommend people get around a government-operated survivalist or phony survivalist community because it gives the whole... And they're looking to set people up. And they're looking to set people up. So you don't want to join survivalist groups that are very public, militia groups. You want to be supportive. But if you join, all of those organizations get infiltrated. It's very dangerous to be a part of it. So I recommend informal networks of people. This concludes the main body of the documentary film, Strategic Relocation, with Joel Skousen. If you get the DVD at InfoWarsStore.com for your library, it has an expanded extras section dealing with securing the home itself uh, that is really just a gateway into truly securing your home. And Joel Skousen breaks that down in his book, The Secure Home, also available at InfoWarsStore.com. And, of course, uh, of all of these uh, materials that Joel Skousen's produced, the book itself is simply amazing, and everyone uh, needs to have this. I know I certainly have multiple copies uh, in my home and also in my car because it serves as an amazing roadmap in major cities uh, for uh, routes uh, that the general public doesn't use in case of large traffic jams and, and just dozens of other things, water quality in the area, nuclear reactors, military base sites, uh, where foreign um, nuclear attacks are targeted. Um, hats off to Joel Skousen and his team for, for putting together uh, these books, and hats off to my team, uh, Rob Jacobson, Darren McBreen, uh, Rob Dew, and the rest of the InfoWars crew for putting together strategic relocation, uh, the film. So again, I invite all of you to start getting prepared today. The journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, and things that you think are really hard to do are actually easier than you think and quite exciting. Last week on the radio, in closing, I told the story of how I uh, would go on the hike and bike trail and hike, and I see people running on really rough trails with no shoes. And I was thinking a few weeks ago on an, on an eight-mile hike trying to get in shape, I remember being a kid running around in the woods by my house and down the street and down gravel roads without shoes uh, in, in the summer. Uh, and, and then I remembered how during the winter I'd have boots on or shoes and my feet would be soft at the first of the summer, but by the end they were like shoes. I mean, God gave us great design where we have basically shoes that keep regrowing uh, the soles. And so I went for a mile walk uh, without shoes on a gravel gully trail, and the first few hundred yards it was torture. All of a sudden my feet went numb, and I was able to jog back the half mile back. I only got a few cuts on my feet. 
uh, and now I'm growing even bigger calluses. And my point is, it's like that politically or anything. You've just got to start applying pressure to the system that you know what they're doing, while at the same time getting yourself prepared and warning others. This is a life and death situation we're talking about, and that's why we put together this preparedness film. I'm Alex Jones signing off for the InfoWars.com team. Please use the Internet and this information while it's still here. The system is moving towards curtailing free speech, not just here, but worldwide. So let's go to the East Coast now, Alex, and explain one of the more difficult states to get out of and live in. We're going to talk about New Jersey. New Jersey is a zero-rated state, like Florida and Hawaii. It's just got a tremendous amount of, uh, of difficulties to overcome. Uh, it isn't to say there aren't some nice rural farm areas in New Jersey, but New Jersey has the problem that is backed up by all of this population center, Staten Island, Manhattan, and uh, everybody's going out through Jersey even to get up towards New York. So this is one of the most difficult things to consider as well when you consider you've got Philadelphia right here so that you're sandwiched and even people trying to go this way is going to run smack into the social unrest of Philadelphia. Going down south in terms of retreats is a problem because you've got this Delaware River coming up here. You're cut off except for a few bridges. There's nothing worse than trying to retreat and having millions of people come down there and get stuck at a bridge where nobody can get across. <clears throat> so I have taken time in the book to give a very specific example of how you plan if you have to live in New York and you're living in a, a suburb of, uh, of Newark, for example, of how to get out of this area and how carefully you have to plan. I'm going to switch to this larger map now to indicate how to do this. This is Newark, Manhattan here, Staten Island. In our example, we've got a couple, a family living in Livingston. This is in a suburb, and there are miles and miles and waves of suburbs. They don't start to really get rural until you get out about this far. This is a close-up of where we live in, in, uh, uh, in Livingston here, and it shows the problem. We've got freeways here and here, and a lot of people don't realize that these freeways are trap zones. You cannot cross the freeways unless you find an entrance or an off-ramp or an exit. And I believe that in a crisis, not only will the, free the freeways be packed full of people, that all of the on-ramps and the off-ramps will be packed with people too, and you won't be able to cross the freeway, even if you don't want to get on the freeway. But in every freeway, there are a few places one is right here. This road goes under the freeway, and there is no off-ramp or any on-ramp. So you can scoot on by that freeway and get going further on. This is another alternate route that I've planned out here. These are all rural roads, non-major or secondary roads that also go under the freeway here. It's very, very important. You've got river obstacles here. You've got to watch for bridges got to plan various bridge routes to make sure that you can get across there. So now going back into the larger map, we're trying to avoid Picatinny Arsenal, which is a secondary nuclear target here. We'll stay away, give them a wide berth. The freeway goes much, much too close to that area. Uh, if you ever do, by the way, get on a freeway, you want to make sure that you get on past any major cities so that there isn't anything to block your way. If you take 80, which is the better freeway in getting out, it takes you up towards northern Pennsylvania. It's the clearest route out of the east to take Interstate 80. 78 takes you right into Philadelphia, not a good freeway to get on. You're going to have to get off before that. And you have to get around these areas, mostly through secondary roads if you're going to bypass Philadelphia. If this is clear, if you get on after Susquehanna, your chances of getting all the way to near Buffalo are pretty good on that freeway. But for our example here, we're going to take and do a retreat in a rural town called Newton here. And the alternate routes are the ones in gray. This is the main route that we've chosen. Tried to avoid bridges, but you can't with this many rivers here. Uh, once on a rural road, we want to avoid going through the town of Susquehanna. So this is our primary route, even though it goes longer and further away to get to Newton, this is the preferred route. 
you really want secondary roads, not freeways, um, that go through as few towns, and it's very difficult to find because secondary roads do go through towns. So basically, wherever you live, you should at least think about evacuation routes that aren't on the main road. I mean, when it's Friday night, you can't get home because of the traffic. Whenever there's a hurricane, it creates traffic all over the state because everybody drives up. People die on the highway. They get stuck for days. They run out of gas. I mean, if you get a real collapse or a war or an attack, it, it would just be bedlam. That's right. One of the interesting things to practice is during maximum traffic hour, when even the secondary roads in a town going to places are pretty full of traffic, try to map out a route where you only go on the residential streets and time yourself, and you'll find generally you'll get through faster by sticking just to the resident. And that simulates- I already do that. That I mean, simulates what you would do, is actually go down residential roads that uh, just have houses on either side that are not a secondary road. But this is the key. The key is finding, and you have to do this with Google Maps. If you get to Google Earth or satellite view, you can zoom in close enough that you can see, if you follow this freeway with your mouse, you can find areas that don't have an, uh, an on-ramp or an off-ramp. And that's the secret for getting through. But bottom line, if you can, don't live in New York or New Jersey. Don't live in Hawaii. Don't live in Florida. And if you're gonna have to live in one of these other states, live near enough to one of these safer pockets. That's right. And what I tell people uh, is that you do have time. Uh, I'm convinced that this, uh, the scenarios that we talked about of economic collapse are not gonna occur precipitously. The dollar cannot be devalued. A devaluation refers to a fixed rate compared to another currency that is allowed to make one get lopsided and a devaluation occurs, they change the fixed rate and suddenly it's worth 30% less. That can't happen with the dollar. It's not pegged to any other currency. Other currencies are pegged to the dollars that have fixed rates. They can collapse. So the dollar is the world reserve currency. All they can do is slowly debase it. That's right. That's all they can do. And the base is so big that it's going to take a long while to debase $400 trillion and turn it into... But it's causing the other currencies to accelerate their debasement. So that's, that. you know, the experts think there's some trigger point where it accelerates the devaluation. Well, I'm not so sure because we have to remember that the other currencies love U.S. inflation. That allows them to hide their increased inflation and still stay equal with the dollar. So there really aren't a lot of people in international banking services that are against dollar devaluation. Bottom line, the globalists have thought this out. They have thought this out. They're protecting themselves. Uh, it's got a long way to go. I'm predicting a downhill slide till they have an exit strategy. War will solve it all. Then they can erase can it all. They can erase it all. Force du jour. We walk away blameless. But here's the question. Why are they digging in? People say, Alex, why are you concerned about this? Why are the elite digging in? Because they don't want, and they know that the, the world population, especially the U.S. population, will not accept boiling the frog forever. At some point, they will rebel. I'll tell you. When they have to go defend a wetlands violation in The Hague and hire an international attorney, you're going to have hell to pay politically. They're going to say, get us out of that treaty. Get us out. We demand to remove from the United Nations. That would start to happen if they really started They've to They've got us under UNESCO it. trying to ban people doing chores on the farm. We Again, they know, I agree with you, they're accelerating their program. I agree, they want to do it long term, but it's a catch-22. Long term, yeah, they can get it done, but they don't have long term because we're checkmating them. So it's almost like the Patriot Liberty Movement is so successful, we're almost driving them into a confrontation. Where they have to choose war as the ultimate thing to knock down the opposition. The war knocks down all opposition. So then why not go ahead and give in to them? I, I'm not saying that, because, but, but if we're driving them into doing this, which I agree, then why do we do the right thing? Because justice be done, may the heavens fall. We can't give in, it's against our principles. We can't just walk in and say, we give up. So it's better to confront them and force them to react on our turf than to just lay down. Absolutely, because at least we build a remnant. This is my, I mean, I, I, to me it doesn't matter if, if I don't believe that we can win back the whole nation. My purpose is do what's right, convert as many people as possible, leave the rest up to the Lord, create a remnant, and out of that remnant, he can inspire them to band together to build liberty anew. But I believe personally that we'll build liberty anew in pockets, not as an entire nation. A nation has to go through tribulation, retribution, collapse and fall before it rises again. And it starts like the U.S. did as a pocket. You didn't and you can't reform London. You couldn't reform England. They tried. 
for nearly a hundred years. But you create the, the pockets on common sense and biblical principles, and then it expands again. That's right, we, had no, we have no other colonies. There's no more Americas to discover, but there are out of the way wilderness places. There it's are like places. rediscovering freedom, colonies of freedom. That's right, and we're gonna build colonies of freedom around the world, and most of them are gonna be in the United States because that's where most of the freedom educated but loving people are. But they'll have such success that it will then become an example. Instead of America now being this model of evil, did you see where the communist Chinese used the NDAA as an excuse to pass a similar law? Yes, yes. I mean, now America's gone from the light on the hill to this dark light. And in fact, the Russians themselves have increased their sophistication about the use of conspiracy and feigning weakness through watching the American globalists do it to us. And in fact, that's what Russia Today, RT Television, is focusing its attention on American conservatives. American conservatives keep thinking, wow, we got a television station that tells the truth. Well, they're not telling the truth because they like us. They know that it will foment division and they hope to capitalize on that someday. But uh, these KGB disinformation outfits are not our friend, even though they tell the truth a good portion of the time. I've noticed they let me on RT America that's just focused here. They do not have that's me. That's right. They do not have me on the big global one that's actually on broadcast TV in Europe. Watson says, because I have guys that work for me over in England, uh, or they contract for me over there writing those articles, Great Minds, and they say, yeah, this is on broadcast TV here, not just on cable, but that's the big RT. But but they'll have me on to talk about it here, but it's compartmentalized. That's right, absolutely. So my message to your audience here today is prepare wisely in advance. I've got plenty of information about doing contingency planning, that you don't have to make the leap before you're ready but do it wisely, prepare stages. There's dozens of strategies that people can implement successfully, evade these problems, get out of town when you need to, but they need to read the book. They do. And the book, ladies and gentlemen, is available at infowars.com, Strategic Relocation, North American Guide to Safe Places, third edition, and also when you order it at infowars.com, you'll get other evil contraband like a pocket constitution, Infowars bumper stickers, free added to that. We also carry books on Agenda 21 and a lot more at infowars.com, but this is invaluable. It's the best book out there, and that's why I'm promoting it. I also hope you'll get copies of this DVD presentation and give it to everyone you know, so they'll at least start the process of thinking about protecting themselves because the government can't and won't protect you. It is up to you in the final equation. That's it for this extended uh, breakdown. Great job, Joel Skousen of uh, World Affairs Brief. We're going to also have some extras here on the DVD uh, that expand on how to secure your redoubt or your uh, bug out location, that cabin, if you're able to secure it. So that's coming up in the expanded extras. Thank you for watching.